All right, I think we're live. So how's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining here for another live stream. And uh, <clears throat> hope you guys are all enjoying this beautiful day in May. Thanks for uh, spending some time indoors here to hang out and uh, join for the live stream. I'm sure there's lots of fun, exciting outdoor things to do. We were just outside having some fun as well. I have a Toyota GR86 this week. I was having a little bit of fun in earlier. And uh, so, yeah, like all the other live streams we always do here, I'm going to try and go for about two hours or so. And, uh, you know, it's going to be the same setup where, you know, I always give priority to people who do any kind of super chats. And also one new component since the last live stream from a few months ago is that we now have channel memberships here. So anyone who is a member, you'll see they have a little... Uh, either Super Dorex fan logo or a little Matt Moran motoring logo next to them. Uh, those questions will also get priority now uh, since they're members. But uh, otherwise, you know, usually I stay on long enough. I can answer most questions on here, hopefully, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not you're uh, a member or anything like that. But there's cool perks if you're a member. So check it out if you haven't already. But anyway, so... Uh, Welcome to those of you who've already joined in here. I see we have Marco, who's a member. Thank you for joining Marco. And um, that washer nerd here uh, with the first uh, comment here says, test drove the new Deborah X yesterday in both manual and CVT. The CVT was surprisingly responsive and felt better than the auto in my G37 even. So that washer nerd is the one who has the G37 X that I reviewed a few months back. Um, I'm surprised they have CVT Deborah Xs at the dealers because... I still have not heard anything about the CVT WRXs. I, I mean, when I was on the launch back in December for the WRX, they said, oh, yeah, we'll have a new launch for the CVT version whenever that um, is available. But there was production delays. And then we never heard anything. At least I never heard anything else after that. So I'm not sure. I had no clue they were actually at dealers. So thank you for that information. Um, well, interesting. I wonder if they're just not going to do a launch for the CVT version uh, for some reason. I don't know. Very interesting, but um, glad you found it impressive. You know, I mean, they seem very excited about it themselves, um, but I'm still a little skeptical. I'd like to try it myself. We'll see if they come into the press fleet or something, but uh, thanks for the info. Uh, Zachary Jones says, hey, Matt, I saw your Instagram story and can't wait for the review of the 2013 slash 2014 Shelby GT500. Been waiting for that review for years. I know it's a gap that I've had. And, you know, as far as reviews, I've never done that generation of GT500. And uh, so, yeah, someone reached out and offered it. It's a 2014, actually. And it has a few light mods. So it's about 660 wheel horsepower. So a little bit faster than stock. But, you know, uh, it was a lot of fun. As you'll see, that video will be going live on Wednesday. Um, so Monday here at like 12.01 midnight, uh, you know, tonight will be the z review and then wednesday i'll be followed up by the gt500 so it should be a fun week for car reviews here hopefully you guys will enjoy them um so other questions here i'm also going to try and just scan and make sure i don't miss any of the uh, member comments or anything like that um so steven rap saying hey matt how's that bullet mileage uh it's doing well still just wish i had more time to drive it but it's uh i was able to actually put about 450 miles on it to go out to meet up with the owner of that gt500 that i reviewed last week and so uh this is really nice to kind of put some substantial miles on the bullet again and do a nice long road trip in it for the day and uh so yeah but it's currently at 17,300. So still far less than what I wish it had on it. But um, I'm going to work on that this year and hopefully do some more road trips in it and uh, get that mileage up. I want to at least try and get over 20,000 miles this year. We'll see see how it goes. Um, so other questions here. Goth Rocker says, remember, Subaru does not call it a CVT. It's a performance transmission. Yeah, the Subaru performance transmission. Uh, marketing for some of these companies. It's uh, a little funny. It's like I mean, I guess maybe there are some people who genuinely don't know about cars and they see super performance transmission and maybe they think it's a dual clutch or something. But I feel like any enthusiast that's actually shopping sees right through that marketing talk, you know, like, I don't know. But then again, there are every once in a while, it's kind of enlightening to see, like, if I go to a car show or I go somewhere else, um, like even like the auto shows, like we have, you know, in the convention centers here and stuff where like there's people that walk around that like know cars and I'm like quietly like listening and they're like, everything they're saying is completely false. There's a lot of that kind of stuff. So maybe, you know, stuff like super performance transmission actually fools a lot of people. I don't know. Um, Co uh, Copper says, any updates on new car for Beth? Um, so yeah, I talked about this a little bit with the members, but um, there's still, um, it's we're still kind of in a holding pattern with Beth's car. So her lease actually was supposed to be up at the end of April. We had to extend it out two months to buy us a little more time to figure out what exactly we're going to do. We're pretty sure we've decided what we're going to do. Um, 
there's still a couple reservations about the situation. I still, I hate being vague about it, but I also just don't want to like announce something and then have to do a whole explainer as far as why we picked what we picked and then just end up having to pick something else or something, you know, not working out and then having to backtrack and all that. So I want to make sure that whenever I do announce it, I know for sure that's actually what we're getting before I uh, say anything. So I apologize for being weird about it. I don't want to, you know, I would just, I like being blunt and, you know, open, but, um, yeah, it's, it'll most right now I can say that we'll probably hopefully have something by July. Um, and we'll do, you know, videos and stuff on it then. Um, so, but it's still not a done deal. Um, and there's still a couple other cars in the running. We're pretty, I would say we're like 90 to 95% sure which way we're going to go. Um, and so, but we're also kind of just waiting on stuff because as many of you know, there's not a lot of inventory out right now. Um, getting stuff is tough. So there's multiple factors going in, <laughs> going into everything. And there's some other new stuff that's come up here in the past month or two that's complicated things a little bit, but pretty sure we're still going to stick with what we originally were planning, but we'll see. Um, but anyway, thanks for asking. And yeah, hopefully we'll have something here by this summer and uh, you guys can see. And I'm excited to actually start making videos on this new vehicle as well. It'll be a, a new uh, source of content, I think. It'd be something you guys will be a little bit interested in, hopefully. Um, so other questions here. Uh, we have uh, Moises that uh, says, hey, how's it going? I uh, hope you all been doing good. Thank you for joining. Hope everyone here has been doing well and uh, staying safe and healthy and everything. It's a crazy world out there still. Um, and uh, so Omar says, Matt, 2019 Mustang, 29,000, 40,000 miles or 2015 Mustang GT, 29 grand, 50,000 miles, which is the better deal? Um, I mean, on the surface, if it's only 10,000, interesting. So it's 10,000 less miles for a 2019 Mustang. Oh, wait, one's, I guess, an EcoBoost and one's a GT. Maybe I'm guessing uh, as far as your question goes. Um, you know, it comes down to you know, whether you want a good fuel economy. Do you want, uh, you know, the V8 sound, V8 power? Um, you know, if it were me, I would probably go for the 2015 GT because the GTs are just so much more fun. But we do live in the reality of very high gas prices these days. So I wouldn't blame you for going for the EcoBoost. They're still a lot of fun as well. Um, but I would say that I'm more confident in the long term durability of the GT motor versus the EcoBoost. So if it's a, you know, if you're already at 50 grand, you know, 50,000 miles or 40,000 miles, you know, if you're planning to keep them over 100,000 miles, I'd you know, be more confident doing that in GT than I would in an EcoBoost. Um, so hopefully that maybe helps you a little bit with your decision there. Uh, if you can, I would say at least with the 2015 Mustang, try and find a 2016 for similar money. Cause at least the 16s, you can get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto still, which is the one real big thing that the 15s are missing. Um, you know, and the 2019s obviously have that. That's a nice thing to have. But so I would try and say, because the 15s have that, you know, crappier, older sync infotainment system, which works, but, you know, it's just nice having the smartphone integration. So I would go 16 Mustang GT if you can find it. And plus you get the cool uh, built-in uh, turn signals in the hood scoop as well, which is uh, something I actually missed. I wish the bullet had. Um Alvarez says you're getting a GT500. I'm definitely not. Um, it's just a car review that I, I'm going to be posting next week. But Kyle, thank you so much for the first super chat. He says, nothing to say, but here's two gallons of gas, hopefully at least uh, on me. Keep up the good work, Matt. Thank you. I appreciate that, Kyle. I appreciate you being a member as well. Uh, your support really means a lot. I really appreciate it. And uh, speaking of the two gallons of gas, actually, when I was on this road trip this past week, at least on the uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike here, which is probably higher as far as gas prices go, but I did pay $5.29 for premium, um, which here on the East Coast is pretty bad. So um, almost two gallons of gas, but it's crazy. And I just had to fill up Beth's Mercedes here yesterday. And that thing has a really big tank. I guess, you know, German vehicles, they love having these large tanks for grand touring and stuff. Um, I think it's only roughly like a 16 and a half gallon tank or something like that. But I ended up, it was really low. I put like 16 gallons in it. And that even with like a slight discount we have with our like uh, fuel perks with our grocery store, it still was like $80, like $80 and 59 cents to fill up her car. It's like, whew, like at the worst, it used to be like 60 bucks to fill that thing up. So it's, it's uh, not fun uh, doing a fill ups here these days. I'm a little bit envious of all those people with electric vehicles that just roll right by the gas stations and don't have a care in the world. <laughs> it's uh, certainly a good time to be an EV owner. Um, so other questions here, uh, we uh, have 
Biomosbet, uh, maybe, I don't know how I, you say your username, but he says, what do you think about the STI EV? I think I'm the only one who's extremely excited to see the end result. Um, I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot of really sweet EVs from a power standpoint. I mean, obviously anything they do is going to be super fast. Um, it'll be very impressive in a straight line. And I guess if they want to compete with the Teslas and stuff, then that's the way to go. Obviously though, it sounds like it's going to be a ways off. I mean, cause they're saying it's not going to be for this generation. Obviously this generation is not set up for EV platforms and the Debrex just came out. I mean, and the last one came out in 2015. So we're dealing with a seven year window here. So I'd say you got another seven years, maybe six, if you're lucky, you know, before a new STI comes could even be longer than that. So it's um, it's going to be a long wait. And I think the world's going to be changed a lot in the next six or seven years from an EV standpoint that an STI EV is going to have to be really crazy because when you're going to have every soccer mom SUV having 400 horsepower in five years or so with an EV you know, set up, uh, you know, it's not going to be enough if it's a 400 horsepower STI. It's going to have to be crazy. And then it kind of misses what an STI even is. I, yeah, you know, it's just like is it STIs and the Evos and Type Rs, they're always, you know, souped up economy cars. And if it just turns into some completely different thing and morphs into some, you know, super sedan electric thing, it'll be cool. It'll be different, you know, but it's just to me, just not the same spirit as the old STIs. I'd love to be proven wrong. We'll see what happens. Um, but I think you are one of the few people that is actually excited about that. Uh, it seems like everyone else is not excited. Uh, Mo's asking, any idea in your opinion when the supply chain issues for cars will finally return to normal? Um, I've seen and read that like mid to late 2023 is when you can safely assume that. Um, but just because supply chain stuff gets back to normal doesn't mean the car world will get back to normal because a lot of these car companies, or at least the dealers, the car companies would love to sell as much as they can. But the dealers are kind of saying now they, they're done with having these massive inventories. The massive inventories thing is a uniquely American thing of going and buying a car off a lot and having immediate uh, satisfaction. That's not something you get most other places. Um, obviously, this is, you know, I guess, stereotyping in a way, but most Europeans... It seems like they don't do that. That's not a normal thing. People have ordered cars for a long time and specified what they wanted exactly. And, you know, and obviously there are some Americans that do that, but it's a lot more rare. And so I think we're going to go more towards that European car buying model in the future where, you know, there aren't going to be deals. It's going to be like they, they rather have just enough so that they can't, you know, be uh, they so they have all the power. They're like, well, we only have five of these, so you either take it at this price or you don't. I think the dealers are addicted to that power now. They're not going to give that up. So I think, you know, even if there's plenty of supply, they're going to artificially hold that back because they like those big fat profits. And they'll try and obviously up the supply a little bit because obviously they want not only profits but also volume. And the perfect world for them is having both, and they obviously can't because there's you know, this equilibrium and this balancing act. But I think. They'll slowly up the uh, you know uh, amount just enough so that there's you know I think like what Toyota is doing with the GR Corolla where Toyota literally said we want to build one less than there's demand for just to put that pressure on those consumers so that everyone pays sticker price without a complaint and everyone you know um, you know everyone is spoken for and you don't have to discount cars uh, that works out for the OEMs that work at, works out for the dealers. And it just doesn't, it works out for everyone except the consumer who, you know, I think these high prices are here to stay. What that does to the used car world, I don't know. Um, you know, I think that we still are in a bubble. There's no reason why a used RAV4 should cost more than a new one. I don't care how hard it is to get a RAV4 brand new. You should not have, be, you, know, you shouldn't be expected to pay that much for a used one. So I think the bubble will burst on the used cars. I just don't know when. It could be once the subprime auto loan thing finally pops, because I think there's a ton of people buying these very expensive cars they can't actually afford, especially with inflation these days. And you're going to see kind of an 08 style thing where, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of people that just quit paying their car loans eventually. And that bubble pops. Obviously, it's a little bit easier. You can sell cars a lot easier than you can houses. And it's not as, you know, it's not going to be as bad as I think, you know, the 08 housing crisis or anything. But I think that's still what I'm envisioning is there's going to be something like that where I uh, just, you know, a lot of people walking back on these big purchases that they really can't actually afford. I mean, you're seeing the average transaction prices. You know, was it was at $45,000. Like the average American does not have $45,000 to spend on a car. So we're either people are just not being financially responsible or 
you know, something is happening and it, it doesn't make sense and it will correct itself eventually. It's just the way that, you know, the market works. It's going to correct itself. And uh, so I still say for anyone that's shopping for cars right now, if you can avoid it, do not buy used unless you absolutely need a car right now. Either buy new at sticker price, so you have some type of relative price protection, or you know just wait um, because everyone that's buying a used car right now basically is overpaying in my opinion. It's just you're not going to get a good deal on anything unless you're maybe buying a classic because some of those haven't really gone through the roof. If you buy like a less desirable classic or something like that. Um, but anyway, a little bit of a tangent, but still I think it's going to be a mess for at least another year or two here with the uh, car world. And even after that, it might not get much better. Um, Luco, thank you so much for the super chat though. He says the new Integra gets too much hate. Manual transmission, luxury, fun, sport back is so rare. I will say though, I wish they made it at least like 230 horsepower. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So unfortunately I wasn't able to, I'm not going to be able to go on the Integra launch. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit late as far as reviewing that car, but I'm sure you'll see all the great reviews from everyone else, you know, whenever they go on the launch event here soon um, to see what it's like to drive. But if it's essentially a hatch SI with an Integra interior, you know, it just comes down to what it is worth for certain people. You know, I think it's just, you know, when you get up to 36, $37,000, you know, you're getting into a very, um, very, you know, just competitive space. I mean, there's a lot of nice stuff you can get. I mean, 30, you know, almost if $39,000, you can get a Kia Stinger with 300 horsepower, a bigger hatch, more luxury. Obviously, yes, it's not a manual. So, I mean, you know, for those few people who absolutely must have a manual and will not compromise on that, you know, you're right. There's very few options out there, but I think for a lot of people, it's not that big of a deal. And you see stuff like the Stinger with, you know, a hundred more horsepower for $3,000 more. Like, you know, it's almost a no brainer, um, you know, depending on what you want. Obviously the Integra is going to be lighter. They did a good job of keeping the weight down on it and stuff, but you know, there's, there are just a lot of other fun things you can get for around that price tag. So, you know, and I mean, honestly, even if the used market does get back to normal here in a year or so, you know, you'll be able to actually get, you know, a used TLX of this current new generation for probably about that much money, you know? So, you know, I don't know. I still think they could have kept the price on a little bit lower, but again, the thing that's so hard, even with new car pricing here is, you know, with these car companies, they can charge whatever they want because whatever they don't, if, even if they, you know, made the pricing lower, the dealers would market up to whatever people are willing to pay anyway. So the manufacturers are like, well, well, let's just jack up the prices for the next couple of years here, get rid of our base trims. Cause we don't have enough, uh, you know, chips to go around anyway. Like I mentioned in the weekly update this week with the Honda Odyssey dropping its base trim and jumping $4,000 in price. It's just like, you know, they know that, you know, they want to get the profit margin and keep their profits protected. They don't care about the consumer. And so, you know, they jack up the prices. Whoever can pay it can pay it. Everyone else just toughs it out and keeps their current car running with whatever they can or whatever. And it's unfortunate. But, you know, so I think with the Integra, there's no pressure, you know, because like you said, there's not much competition. And then, you know, even if there were competition, it's like, okay, well, there's still not enough cars for everyone. So let's just charge whatever we want. And then, you know, once things get back to normal, I think you're going to see that too, where car companies are going to price everything at a 2022 price. And then in 2024, when things actually get back to normal, you might see a lot of these cars start to get big price cuts where they're like, oh, wait, now we actually be competitive again. We actually have to try again and actually try and lure people in with pricing, which they didn't have to do for the past couple of years. And then they might actually feel like, you know, there's a little bit of pressure on them to finally make a competitive price point um, because unfortunately a lot of stuff just is not a competitive price point anymore. And the companies know they have that power so they don't have to worry about it. So not a good situation again for consumer. But anyway, Stephen Rapp, thank you so much for the very generous super chat. He says, have a 2020 GT500 Kona Blue with 10,000 uh, painted stripes, which is, uh, yeah, the 10,000 10, option. That's impressive. Carbon fiber upgrade and a 2020 C8 Cor Corvette convertible. Uh, both have less than, a, oh, 1,000 miles. Uh, so thinking of selling, which one, how do I become a member? Um, there will be a link. There's a link in the description. Um, you can click there to uh, become a member and join. There's also there should be a link or a, a little join button either on the video page here or on the channel page. But I think you have to be on a computer to do it. For some reason, I don't think it works on a phone, which is kind of dumb. But um, that's how you become a member. As far as which one to sell, I mean, you know, I think both are going to be fairly collectible down the road. So I would probably say neither if you don't need to if you want to sell one uh i would probably say the c8 corvette because it's 
to me, I mean, you know, they made plenty of them. They're not, you know, uh, I mean, they're obviously very sought after, but it's not quite as special as the GT500, in my opinion. If it were my money between the two and I can only have one, I would have the GT500. Um, and also now with the existence of the Z06 C8, you know, that's going to be amazing coming out here later this year. Um, you know, if you can, you know, just leave that money uh, you know, for car purchases, then, you know, sell the C8 convertible while you can now, and then, you know, put that money towards a Z06. Uh, I think that would be my play if, you know, I had, uh, you know, the kind of money to do that. Uh, that would be the way to go there, especially if you can get a, you know, convertible Z06. Um, that would be, or maybe just you do the hard top and take the roof off. But either way, I'm very excited for the new Z06. Um, and uh, he says, great advice. He sold his bullet. Well, that's a car. I mean, I don't, I don't blame you since you have the GT500, but I'm, my bullet is definitely a keeper. That's another special one. Um, so, and uh, Fastline says he can't find the member thing either. Yeah, there. so it should say, click here to get access to perks in the description of the video here. Um, but if that doesn't work on mobile, then you got to just go on a computer, I guess, to do it. I'm not sure why YouTube has it set up like that. I apologize if it's kind of tough to get to. Um, so uh, Revento says, does a mini John Cooper works feel more planted than the Fiesta ST? Um, I have not driven the newest generation John Cooper work, so I can't say if we're talking about the R56, I drove one of those, I think briefly, but I actually have no extensive experience in a John Cooper works aside from the first R53 generation and comparing that to the Fiesta ST. Yes, I would say that feels more planted than the Fiesta. Um, and the Fiesta definitely is just a very lively little car. You know, it loves changing direction. It's very light and tossable, whereas the Mini has heavier steering. Um, it feels like it's got a little bit of a wider base to it, so it just feels a little... Because it's a little more square with the wheelbase and you know, the setup and stuff. So, um, you know, it's just a little a little bit, uh, I guess, more confidence-inspiring in corners. But the Fiesta was great, and it's been, honestly, at this point probably almost eight years since I drove a Fiesta ST as well. So I'm working off, um, you know, faded memories here a little bit, but um, if, they're both fantastic cars though. Can't go wrong with either one. Um, Dave, the car guy says, uh, I drive a BMW M2 competition. Not sure what to get next. Well, if you're happy with it, just keep it, you know, I mean, especially, I mean, I know a lot of people like, you know, cycling through cars. So um, I would say if you're looking for something, different uh, obviously it's going to come down to what you're looking for but if you want something similar to your m2 competition you could just wait for the new m2 here coming out you know this fall or uh, i think it's going to actually debut here uh i think in like a week or two or maybe that's the m4 csl i think the m2 is a little ways off but anyway you know you can see the m2 here in the next few months and decide on that but that should probably be you know a nice little improvement over the current car you can also go for a Supra, stay in the BMW family as far as mechanicals go, but uh, have something a little bit different, a little bit sharper. Um, you know, those are two great picks there, but um, it all comes down to, you know, what exactly you're looking for. Um, the the any the, the New Yorkster says, uh, would you buy the new Z after your experience with it? Um, that kind of gets into driving impressions, which I still can't get into, even though that car has had so many leaks as far as embargo stuff. And that whole launch has been very interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've, you guys have seen some of the videos that were posted and there's stuff that was taken down and it's been a whole thing. Um, so I'm very excited for that whole uh, embargo to be over here at midnight and uh, everything to be out there and, and that whole thing to be done. Um, so I can't talk about the Z just yet, aside from how it looks and how the interior is. So if you have any questions about the looks of the interior, I'm happy to answer them here. Um, aside from that, I'm going to have to just say, stay tuned for the video tonight. It's uh, going to be a long one. It's about almost 38 minutes long. So, um, you know, uh, if you're interested in that, I will have timestamps like I do in every video. So, you know, if you're curious about the pricing, uh, you know, I also have pricing for that car in the description. So if you want to just cliff notes, see the pricing, uh, I'll have it there in the description too of the video, um, but timestamps will be there for you to hop around, uh, skip through the video if you don't want to sit through all 38 minutes. Um, but it's going to be a good one though. I had a lot to say about that car, a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of things to, um, to yeah, just to talk about in that in that in the vehicle in that video. So yeah, stay tuned for that. I'll be I will be very curious to see everyone's thoughts on how Nissan decided to go about it and on my take on it uh, as well, which I don't think will be an uncommon take. I think a lot of people are going to agree with me, but um, 
yeah, it'll be it'll be an interesting thing. Um, yeah, but I, I wish I could say more, but I'm just gonna have to be annoying and give uh, vague responses on that instead. I'm sorry. Um, Zachary Jones says, "Hey Matt, what are some cars you think are underappreciated or forgotten about in the performance car world?" Uh, I think Stinger G70 are two of the top ones that I always kind of uh, you know bang on the door and say like this is an amazing car and no one really you know cares uh, at least as far as just car sales go. Obviously, I know a lot of you guys on the channel here really appreciate those cars, um, you know. But yeah, it's uh, I'd say those are the top two. Other stuff that's underappreciated. Um, you know, I still think the uh, G86 and the BRZ are a little underappreciated. I think that this new generation has gotten a lot more people interested in them because it now, you know, does a little bit, you know, uh, more respectable power numbers and zero to 60s and stuff. But I think that's another car still that a lot of people would probably enjoy a lot more, especially now with the extra power, if they gave it a chance. But a lot of people just see, you know, the low horsepower numbers. Same thing goes for the Miata. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not, I don't like a Miata. It only has 180 horsepower or whatever. But I think Miatas are a ton of fun. And if you gave it a shot, I think a lot of people could appreciate them, you know? So um, I think anything that's lower horsepower like that, a lot of enthusiasts write off because of this, you know, arms race of having to have the most horsepower. And I think that, you know, on the streets, if you're trying to be responsible and you want to actually have fun and actually take your car to red line, you know, I think those low horsepower cars can actually be a lot more fun in a daily drive, you know, in a lot of ways. Plus you get better fuel economy these days as well, which is a nice little uh, upside, but um but yeah so yeah definitely excited for the z review tonight uh as the any the new yorkster says here uh steven rap says can i get memberships on iphone via super chat no computer at home um i don't think you can do it through a super chat i think the only way to do a membership is if you're on a computer i think I think YouTube said they're working on later this year enabling ways for other people to gift people memberships as well. So like I could maybe gift you a membership or something like that that you could then accept on your phone possibly. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's the membership thing. They're still kind of working on things and improving it and stuff. So I apologize if it's not super easy to, to access. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure even if you can't, if you can't use your app on YouTube, you might be able to go to like youtube.com on your phone's browser. Maybe that would work. I haven't tried, but that's the only thing I could suggest as far as that goes. Um, Brian Fisher says, have you built any Lego vehicles other than the Bugatti? The Cyan build was a fun one. Um, nice. Yeah, I have done the Cyan, but I uh, have done the Bugatti. And then I also did the Land Rover Defender. I did that in my Lego video and showed how we put that one together. Um, but aside from those two, I haven't yet. So I have uh, the James Bond um, DB5 uh, that's sitting in a box waiting for the day sometime in the future that I finally have time to do that kind of stuff again. Um, you know, being a, a new dad here uh, with a you know one-year-old I don't have a lot of free time and this channel keeps me really busy as well. So I don't have time to tinker with stuff like that as much as I would like to. Um, but someday I will build the uh, Aston Martin DB5 and I have a little spot. I'm going to put it there and have it, you know, for the background on the weekly update in that area. Uh, whenever in some myth mythical time in the future, whenever I finally have time to build it, I will do that one. Aside from that, there's a, a ton of other ones I'd love to do. I'd love to do uh, some of the Batmobile ones. Um, yeah, there's a ton of cool stuff Legos come out with recently that I'd love to build uh, someday in the future. Um, so Luke O, uh, thank you so much for another super chat. He says, any tips on getting smoke smell out of a vehicle? I've tried some of those sprays and they didn't work much. Um, this is for my work vehicle. Uh, it's tough with smoke. Thank you for the super chat though. Um, I think, you know, back when I used to be a detailer at dealerships, we had a machine that we hooked up to it and we like would leave it running out, like all night in these cars that were smoker cars that got traded in or lease turn-ins and stuff. And I mean, it kind of got rid of the smell, but then it just replaced it with like a funky smell from the machine. So I don't know if that wore off eventually. I never, you know, had the cars stick around long enough. It was enough that I guess they were decent smelling. That they sold them okay and that was it. Uh, but I don't even remember what the name of that machine was, but it was some big industrial thing, I think. Um, but I'm not sure. Maybe there's some other people, like I don't know if some of those uh, guys that are super into detailing, it was like Ammo NYC or some of those guys, maybe they'll have some better tips for you. Unfortunately, I'm pretty out of the loop when it comes to detailing and stuff these days. So I'm not sure what the best... Uh, course of action is there for that but uh hopefully you can figure it out that's definitely uh probably not fun to drive around in a, a smoker truck like that um 
But anyway, um, oh, ozone machine. Okay, Samuel suggesting. Thanks for the suggestion, Samuel. Um, yeah, maybe that's what it was that we had at the at the dealership. But something like that will hopefully help. And maybe you can rent something like that that's with a little more industrial strength to to get something like that out as well. I'm not sure. Um, Dave, the car guy says, are there any cars you would like to own or drive, but don't get sold in the USA? I'd love to own or drive an R34 Skyline uh, GTR and we'll get those here in the next few years. But, you know, as of right now, they're currently not able to, to get here. Um, but other than that, I don't know. There's really nothing personally that I would love to have that's not available here in the States. I mean, because a lot of stuff they've made really good progress in the past few years of bringing stuff over like Pagani's used to never be available here in the States. And now the newer ones, at least the wire and stuff, you can't get here in the States. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's anything that I can think of, honestly, that uh, we can't get over here. Um, Zachary Jones says, uh, what are your thoughts on the Mazda Speed 6? It's a somewhat forgotten performance car, manual transmission, all-wheel drive, and a turbo. That was another one that, yeah, I think was underappreciated for sure, you know, especially these days. It's such a rare combination. Um and uh, yeah, they're pretty cool cars. I think the thing with those is they didn't seem to hold up very well. Um, Cause there was actually, I saw, I follow Autoblog. They do a segment called Junkyard Gems and there was a Mazda Speed 6 that was I think sitting in a junkyard a few months back. And um, it's like, I guess they've depreciated so much that like when there's one that even has mild body damage, it just gets sent to the junkyard instead of actually you know being fixed. So uh, a little bit unfortunate, but I mean, they, they seem like fun. I've never driven one, so I can't say whether it was a good car or not, but the formula seems like it's there and it would be, you know, a lot of fun. Um, okay. Awesome to see uh, Steven also giving a suggestion here for the smoke smell spray vanilla extract and white plastic great for coolers and refrigerators. There you go. Maybe that'll help you out and then maybe just do something for the vents and then you're set. Um, you know, it could help for sure. Uh, Dave says, have you heard of the Alpine A110? I have. That's a really cool car from what it sounds like. James May seems to really like it and anything James May likes, I probably would like as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that'd be one to be fun to try. I just, I don't have any kind of, you know, yearning for it or anything, but uh, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. I have to decline so many spam calls these days. Um, but yeah, so uh, I've never driven one, but it'd be cool to try one out. Uh, Alan says, just got back from taking my 20, uh, 2009 Highland Green Bullet for a ride. Love that car. I still love that generation. I think that's probably, honestly, still my favorite generation from a styling standpoint. It's uh, just, they got the look absolutely right compared to the 68, you know? I think it's such a cool look. Um, I Ideally, I would, uh, the perfect bullet for me, I love my bullet, but the perfect bullet would be like the 08 styling, with the 2019 mechanicals and the 2019 interior that would be like the perfect one for me in my opinion uh but yeah it's awesome you got the 2009 if i had a ton of money in a huge garage i'd probably pick up an 08 or an 09 just to have another one just because i think those were really cool and i kind of regret not buying one back in the day that was like when those came out i was still in my subaru phase of only wanting an all-wheel drive turbo sedan um but uh, I drove one back when those first came out and they were really fun, but I just was too nervous about daily driving a rural drive car in Pittsburgh winters here when I actually had a job or had a commute and I didn't work from home like I do currently. So, but if uh, things were different, I might've you know been able to pick one up if I could have gotten, because there was actually one that got traded into my dealership. They were, I don't know what they were, like 35 grand new or something. And there was one that got traded in for $20,000. And this was back in probably like 09 or 2010. And I was seriously considering getting it because it was still really tempting but someone else actually bought it before i had a chance to uh but it was i was close to getting one of those back then they're awesome um so other questions here oh, i said still runs like brand new too that's awesome um and uh we have supreme pain here says do you think hyundai is going in the right direction i think so i think they're all their stuff is super impressive you know they're coming out with top-notch products I think they're doing great. I know they've gotten some heat in the past, uh, you know, few weeks for engine fire recalls and stuff, but there's recalls and even fire recalls for lots of cars. Tycons were going up in flames. Chevy Bolts go up in flames. Um, there was, I think, a fire recall for something else. There's a, a couple other brands, even with gas powered cars that were going up in flames recently as well. I mean, it's not an uncommon thing. So I think you know, some people take some of those stories and just run with them and just immediately write off an entire brand for something like that, which is silly. Um, but I think Hyundai is doing great. I think whenever it comes to reviewing cars, 
I think that I am more pleasantly surprised or impressed with Hyundai and Kia and Genesis products than anything else that I reviewed in the past few years. Every single time I get in one of these, I'm like, this is fantastic. Other car companies should take note. You know, they're doing things the right way. I think that, you know, obviously they're not perfect. I have my little complaints here and there with, you know, a bunch of their cars, but I think overall, I think they're doing really, really well. And I think that's why they're gaining market share. And, you know, people are really starting to, you know, have a different perception of Hyundai and Kia than they might've had, you know, 10 years ago or so. So I think uh, the hard work's paying off for Hyundai. Um, Robert Russo says, what are your thoughts on the 3.8 liter Genesis coupes after the refresh? Where will drive and 348 horsepower in 2013 seems like an underrated sports car. That's very true. Um, they're another really fun car. I drove one, you know, probably again, like seven years ago or something. And they were a ton of fun. I think the one that I reviewed had wider tires on it. So it really was super grippy. So it didn't have the playful back end kind of characteristic that I usually enjoy in rear wheel drive cars. Um, but I'm sure stock would be pretty sweet. The turbos, uh, one that I did was closer to stock and that was a ton of fun too. Um, I think if I remember correctly, the manuals in those don't hold up super well. Um, I think they're not super durable, but aside from that, I mean, they seem, you know, pretty solid and, uh, yeah, definitely a car worth revisiting here. I'm hoping to maybe start revisiting some of my older reviews and going back and re-reviewing, uh, some vehicles like that, especially if I can find some that aren't modified too much to review. You know, that's another one I'd love to revisit. Um, because especially I think, you know, I've, as you guys will see this year, I'm going to try and do a little bit more used stuff, um, because, with, you know, a lot of these performance vehicles either going away, like the STI, or just getting super expensive, you know, once used car prices, again, come back to earth, I think that there's going to be kind of a resurgence in all these other used performance vehicles from the past 10 years that maybe some people slept on, that now people are like, oh, wait, that was amazing. Why did we not appreciate that? I'm going to go buy one. And so I think the Genesis Coupe could be one of those cars, potentially. And um, yeah, I think that they're, they're you know, really cool cars. So yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, so another question here: um, What if you traded, or what if I traded you for your bullet? Even would you? Um, I must have missed the first part of your question as far as uh, what you trade. But honestly, I wouldn't trade the bullet for anything. I love that thing so much. Um, yeah, so I no matter what, I would I think I would keep the bullet. I wouldn't trade for a GT500 even if it was an even trade because that's how much I love this thing, which is crazy, I know, but. That's so much I love the bullet. It's kind of an illogical love in a lot of ways. Um, it's just I love the bullet theme. I love you know this whole Steve McQueen connection and and all that for personal reasons. And so um, it just anything that's not a bullet just isn't as exciting from a Mustang standpoint, in my opinion. Um, so um, I see a, a question about the Z. I'm going to I can't talk about pricing, so I'm not even going to get into that. Orion, I, I wish I could get into that. Maybe I should have done this live stream tomorrow night instead, instead of tonight so we can unpack uh, all of my thoughts in the video on the Z. Um, maybe we'll do another one tomorrow night. We'll see if I have some time to squeeze one in or something. But uh, the Zane 03 says, new Doug video drop. What are some of your predictions on future classic cars? I believe a 350Z Nismo. Um, I think that a lot of that stuff from, you know, as you're seeing with the Radwood stuff <clears throat> where, you know, a lot of stuff from the eighties and the nineties is starting to become, you know, more and more valuable. You know, there's a lot of stuff from the early two thousands. That's going to be the next thing up. And it's, it's all about just, you know, the generations that are coming in that are having money finally to buy the dream cars they couldn't afford back when they were a teenager, you know, and, uh, the three fifty Z's are one of those cars. And so I think, uh, a lot of that stuff that's, uh, you know, especially if you can find some that's uh, that are stock, because that's the hard thing with all this stuff. I mean, stock WRXs, someday a stock bug eye O2 WRX is going to go for enormous money, just like Integra's, you know, go for crazy money now. Same thing, because it's just like, it's, there's going to be so few of these cars that are, you know, untouched. The ones that are out there and remain in good shape are going to be worth a ton of money. Same thing goes for the 350. Everyone mods their 350s. The one, you know, the few people that you know kept the 350s in a garage and didn't drive them that much, they're going to, uh, you know, have a big payday, I think, down the road. Other stuff, I mean, I'd have to like put more thought into this and really like go through a list and kind of give a comprehensive answer. Um, but I would say that a lot of that stuff you know, is poised to make a return. I even could see stuff that's like been very underappreciated that may someday 
again, just because it's so rare, become more valuable, like a Pontiac Solstice. When is the last time you've seen a Pontiac Solstice on the road? For me, it's got to have been at least a couple of years. Um, so those things have already been kind of either mothballed or junked, depending on, you know, the kind of life they live. But, you know, I think that's another car that, like, you know, will be the – Two early 2000s Radwood thing of like, wow, like, look, someone has a Solstice or someone has a Chrysler Crossfire or someone has, you know, the Saturn Sky Red Line and all these crazy things um, that, uh, you know, people probably didn't love very much when they first came out, but, you know, will come around and be worth big money. Like a Dodge Magnum is another one that like, you know, I mean, those were pretty well liked when they first came out, but like, when's the last time you've seen a Dodge Magnum on the road? For me, it's been years and years. So like, you you have someone has like a Dodge Magnum SRT8 that's in actually good shape and hasn't been, you know, again, put through the ringer. Could be a big money car someday as well. Um, you know, anything I'd say that's performance oriented, especially will be, you know, valuable as we go towards, you know, this electrified future. I think everyone eventually will get to a point where there are no brand new gas powered stuff to buy that's at least affordable. And so we'll have to all start going backwards. And so I'm like, all right, we'll take your pick from the past 120 odd years of what gas fired stuff you want. If you want to stick with that, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's just only going to be so many cars and there will be no new inventory coming in. Essentially you'll be stuck with whatever is out there. And that means that all those things will eventually go up in value. Um, how much will depend on the vehicle, but I think that all that stuff's going to appreciate at some point. Um, Dom Farrell, thank you so much for being a member. Thanks for saying hi and for stopping in. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them here and I'll be sure to um, answer them. Uh, but thank you again for being a member, Dom. Um, and uh, so Pontiac Aztec's another one Omar is suggesting. That's another thing. Like, yeah. When's the last time you've seen one of those? Um, you know, that's another one that everyone hated it, but I think it'll be very famous. And if you're the person who shows up at the, you know, uh, early 2000s Radwood convention in, you know, 10 or 15 years with an Aztec that's actually in good shape. Like, whoa, everyone's going to be coming and mob your car to, you know, check out the Aztec that no one's seen in a decade and everyone hated. And, and you know, so I think there's a lot of that kind of stuff that, uh, you know, if you have, you know, a spare 50 grand to, you know, spend on, you know, a handful of, you know, old unwanted cars right now and you can just store them away in the warehouse and forget about them for 20 years and pull them out, you know, it could be a pretty good investment. And there's actually more and more financial planners that are um, advising people buy certain collector cars instead of investments, especially these days with the stock market in the past week or two. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of thinking that, hey, like these things will actually be worth a good amount uh, down the road, especially if we can keep the gas supply up, you know, with Porsche and companies like that working on e-fuels so that even if, you know, we switch to, you know, mostly electric stuff, you know, if you still have the e-fuels to keep all these collectible cars running, you can still enjoy them and uh, not be frowned upon as much, you know, in the distant future, you know, for having something that's burning something, um, you know, then I think that, uh, you know, that'll really also help that collector car mark to really stay strong. Uh, but Mick Mars is saying, uh, do I still want a Ferrari F12? Um, my love has escalated up now to the A12 GTS. That's the new dream V12 front engine Ferrari that I'd love to have someday. I still wouldn't uh, turn away an F12, but, um, you know, if we're talking about dream cars, A12 GTS is the uh, current one there. Um, but I love the F12 still for sure. But thanks for being a longtime fan for remembering my dream car. That's uh, very nice of you. Um, Jason uh, says, I should have done that with my 2007 Chevy Aveo with 75,000 miles. Hey, I mean, you know, you never know. You never know what uh, turns out to be collectible. I mean, look at all the kind of, I guess, mundane cars from like the 80s and the 90s that are now popular at Radwood and stuff, or even like an average Dodge Caravan from the late 80s or something that has wood paneling that no one would have thought would be cool or collectible. And now, you know, you see one of those and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. You know, it's it's kind of funny how the way, the way things go. Um, uh, so Stanley's asking about whether I'm more excited about the Z or the Super with a manual. I... To give a good answer, I would have to talk about driving dynamics, which I still can't do, unfortunately. Um, but if you're curious about the answer to that question, um, you will find out the answer in the video tonight at midnight that goes live. Um, I, I compare the Z to the Supra a good bit in that video, and um, I give all the pros and the cons between the two. So um, you, know, you definitely want to watch that video tonight for that info. Um Nelson says, uh, where can I find someone to tune my EcoBoost, Matt? I'm in Orlando. 
Um, a lot of the mail-in tunes are pretty good. I whenever I had my EcoBoost, um, trying to remember the name of the tuner that did it, but he just did it remotely. He just had me do you know a few pulls on the highway to you know get the kind of some baseline numbers and then he, you know, sent in the tune and you flash it with the call access port yourself or whatever. And then you're, you're set. Um, but I can't, it's been a long time, I think, since I, since I worked with them. So I'm trying to remember, I mean, you could also just do a cob tune, but honestly the cob tune, it was nice, but you definitely, it changed the character of the car a lot and really put all the power up towards the top of the power band instead of having the meaty torque that the EcoBoost usually have. Um, so it just comes down to what preference you want as far as power delivery and, and all that. Uh, but not sure about Orlando. I'm not, not in that area. So I have no clue about any local tuners. Maybe someone else, if there's anyone else in the Orlando area, uh, they might be able to chime in. I believe Dom actually, who's a member here, who was here a couple of minutes ago. I think he, uh, is in Florida. I'm not sure where, but uh, he might be able to give you some tips possibly. Um, but, uh, yeah, James says he thinks the Z is going to be awesome, um, and Stanley is excited for the video. I'm excited for you guys to check it out. Uh, Sam says, any updates on the Mach 1, and why did you choose it over the Camaro? Um, I have a bullet. I actually still haven't driven the Mach 1. I was really hoping for would send one in the press fleet. The press fleet had one. For some reason, I didn't get scheduled in it. I don't know. It's not always uh, perfect with the scheduling of all these cars, so I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, hopefully someday I get to review a Mach 1 still. And there was actually someone, I think, uh, in D.C. that offered me a Mach 1. So I'm hoping to make a trip down to D.C. here this summer and hopefully review a Mach 1 um, from them. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I'll have to see if it feels better than a Camaro or not. But I think the Camaro still is the handling king, but the Mach 1 has the more enjoyable engine because it's the bullet engine from my car. Uh, I think it's just way more character with that engine. The Camaro has a you know a ton of torque, but it just doesn't have much top end, and it's just kind of flat with the character, whereas you know with that Coyote V8 really screaming and having that high red line and everything, it's just a, a lot more fun. Um, James says, uh, who are your favorite car reviewers? My favorite car of yours, uh, it's got to be Henry Catchpole is one of my favorites from Carfection, hands down. I mean, he also reviews a lot of the dream cars that I wish I could review or own, um, you know, the Bent, the Bentleys, the Aston Martins, the Ferraris. But he's also so concise with his reviews that watching him talk is just like such a, he's such a role model for me because I'm so verbose and I use so many filler words and it's so hard for me to say anything of substance in less than 20 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, he can do such concise videos. He learns so much about the car still in, you know, eight minutes or something. And it's just very impressive. Um, and he's also an excellent driver as well. So I think they're, uh, he's one of the top ones for me. Otherwise though, um, I love Savage Geese. I'm good friends with those guys as well. They're, they're awesome guys. And they just do, I think actually some of the best videos on YouTube from a technical standpoint, if you really, really want to learn about the car, um, you know, they're the ones to go to, you know, for the nitty gritty details and, um, and they're just, yeah, they're fantastic guys as well. But I mean, they really do well um, with those videos. So I think they're another one of my favorites. But there's a lot of, you know, I have a lot of friends in the car reviewer world that all do really good videos and give their own unique perspectives in a lot of different ways. And so it's really just going to come down to, you know, what your preference is as far as, you know, what you uh, what you enjoy and stuff. But um, I'd say those are probably my top two. I mean, there's a couple others that I watch from time to time. I'm trying to think. I, I really don't watch very much YouTube because I'm so busy doing my own stuff. And you'll hear that answer from a lot of other YouTubers where they don't have much time to watch YouTube because they're so busy doing videos for YouTube. Um, but I think, yeah, those are probably my top few. I also love Jason Camisa. And so now that he's on Haggerty, those videos are always pure gold. Again, so packed with information. And he is so smart when it comes to not only assessing a car, but putting that into a relatable and digestible, you know, uh, video or article or even his Instagram post. I mean, he, he does a better Instagram review in a paragraph that I sometimes do in an entire car review because he's just so good at that. And uh, another real role model. And I got to hang out with him actually on the GT500 press launch a few years ago and have a couple of beers with him and stuff. And he is, he is awesome. Matt Fair is another one top-notch driver, a very nice guy as well, whenever you get to know him, and uh, is 
also just very good at reviewing cars and, you know, an excellent driver and another one that I kind of uh, look up to as well as far as just doing very good videos. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I think those are probably the top ones that stand out in my mind. Matt Ferrer did, he kind of upset me whenever he did a, a video on the, he did his review on the bullet and he was kind of just saying it was cheesy and stuff. And I get it. Not, it's, you know, the bullet's not for everybody, but I think he kind of unfairly wrote that car off a little bit. And, um, you know, I actually wrote a comment in his video back when it came out kind of explaining why the bullet is a good value. Cause it's just basically a performance pack level one for barely any extra money to get the extra 20 horsepower and stuff. But anyway, that was the only thing that he let me down on. But otherwise Matt Ferrer is usually really spot on with his reviews for the most part. And, uh, I really like his stuff as well. Um, Dom, uh, thank you again for uh, the comment here. He says, sorry for being repetitive. I'm no longer in Florida now in California. And I think things are uh, being just a bit exaggerated with the EVs. Um, well, feel free to uh, expound. We can talk about EVs. That'd be, uh, it's always an interesting topic to talk about. Um, but first off to Chang, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, he says, uh, would a GR, GR Camry make sense and how much for you to tell a Vin Wiki style story? <laughs> Hashtag baby Mustang. Um, GR Camry would be sweet. I think I'm hoping that, you know, they do more GR things at Toyota with, uh, Akito, uh, Toyota, you know, doing, um, all these awesome things for the company. Uh, you know, anything's possible. So, uh, you know, I, I think Toyota is honestly one of my favorite companies right now just because of the sheer amount of performance vehicles they're putting out and they're doing them well and they're exciting and they're marketing them. They're spending the money to actually advertise these things, which is something you can't say about General Motors, for example. Um, I mean, there is like no marketing campaign for the Camaro and then they wonder why they don't sell. Um, you know, whereas they're doing tons of commercials for GR86 and Supra and Super Bowl ads and all this kind of stuff, you know, so um, you know, I, I really love Toyota right now, but as far as a Vinwicky style story, um, if you're talking about maybe like a background story, I have thought about sitting down and doing something like that. I have a bunch of like non-car review video ideas that I just need the time and the slots in my schedule to do. Cause like, you know, I always just have so many car reviews that instead of having a huge backlog, I try and stay on top of that. So it's just like, I need to get to a point where I like don't have press trips, don't have press cars and don't have uh, very many cars to review from privately owned people anymore. <laughs> if I get to a point where I finally work down all my backlogs, then I can sit down and kind of do some of those fun extra videos. I have a, I have a bunch of really cool ideas. Um, and I may also pivot if the views on the reviews, you know, start to drop off or if, um, you know, there's, if I just feel like changing direction a little bit, then, you know, maybe I will kind of go into, you know, some of that stuff, but I don't really consider myself a vlogger or anything. So, I, you know, I try not to be too personal on the channel anymore. I try and really focus on the cars and not, you know, have the focus really on me as much. Um, but, uh, you know, it'd be fun to do a background story because I think it'd be really enlightening. You know, there's a lot of people now that are, you know, coming onto the scene, doing their own car reviews because there's no you know barrier to entry. Anyone with their own, with their smartphone basically can film, you know, a 1080p or a 4k, you know, car review with that alone and, and post it up and, you know, anyone can do that. So I think it's very, it could be very enlightening to kind of hear, you know, what it takes to actually, you know, make this your full-time job. And, um, you know, obviously that path is different for different people, but, uh, you know, for me, it was a long grind. It's not some overnight sensation that, you know, just happened immediately. It's been, you know, about 10 years of work, you know, with car reviews here to, to be where I am today. And, uh, so it's, it's something that's, you know, definitely takes a lot more work than a lot of people realize. I uh, was Steven Rapp. Thank you so much for another very generous super chat. He says, brother had a 1962 or 63 Galaxy 500 black with side red stripe. Hurts him to think about cars they used to own but should have kept. Yeah, I that sounds like a beautiful car, and uh, I feel the same way. I mean, basically, almost everything that I've sold, I get sentimental about very quickly and miss immediately and, you know, wish that I had it back and all that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel the same way about the BRZ. I feel the same way about my legacy GT, even my first car at 97 Subaru Impreza Outback Sport. Um, I missed that little thing as well. I even missed the mini, even though it left me stranded. The only car I've ever owned that's left me stranded. Um, that mini though, I still, you know, just wish that it hadn't let me down and I could have kept it longer and had fun with it because it was a fun little car. So yeah, I, uh, miss all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, he says can't become a member due to uh, the 
phone issue, but I wanted to show the support. So thank you. I really appreciate the support. Um, Cole, thank you so much for the super chat as well. He says, opinion on 2019 or 2017 Mercedes C43. So I did, I think I, I think it was a 17 that I did the C43 coupe. It was modified a little bit. It just had like a tune on it. Um, but I did do a review on one of those and I'll have a lot of the in-depth thoughts on it in that. Cause that was, you know, me talking about it while I'm actually driving it, um, versus my memory of them since. Uh, but it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a really fun car. I think they sound great. To me, it almost felt like a baby GTR in some ways because you had the oval drive, you had your know, insane, you know, boost from those uh, the turbo, you know, V6 and stuff. It's a ton of fun, um, and you have the nice you know, Mercedes interior, very luxurious, and um, yeah, I think they're great. The only thing is nowadays, you know, you have to be careful about you know a vehicle that's that old that's uh, German because I mean, at least in my experience, working at a BMW, Audi, Porsche dealer, and then again working at a used dealer that sold primarily old German stuff. A lot of those things have electrical gremlins. So if you're considering buying one of those, I would say get it with an extended warranty. Do not, unless you have a huge amount of extra money to pour into maintenance and repairs. Otherwise, make sure you get a warranty on it if you're going to buy a used German vehicle that's more than three years old, I would say. Um, or if you plan to keep it beyond you know, it being three years old. Um, because they can turn into basket cases and have phantom power drains and, you know, alarms going off in the middle of the night for no reason and goofy stuff like that, you know, so, um, just be warned of that whole component of them. But otherwise, I think they're a lot of fun. Little Rockstar RS, thank you for the uh, for uh, refreshing my memory here. He says, I was tuned by Adam with Tune Plus. He doesn't really do EcoBoost Mustangs anymore. He does Focus RS mainly. Okay, so there you go to the, uh, the person who was asking about that earlier as far as the tune for the EcoBoost. Um, and there's also, by the way, you can go, I, there's a playlist on the channel here of all my EcoBoost videos that I did of, you know, reviewing the tunes and, and the Cobb stuff and the exhaust that I had on it, all those things. But thank you for uh, for filling that in here for me. I really appreciate that. Um, and Sam Pong says, why do Mustangs generally outsell Camaros? I think it's the livability. I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they can market it as a performance vehicle, but, you know, who's buying all the EcoBoost Mustangs? Not, you know, the drag racers. It's the average person who wants a cool, comfortable, you know, commuter car but wants to do it with style. That's what the Mustang has always been. You know, it's, it's always been this uh, car that's, you know, had the enthusiast thing, but also had the comfort thing and uh, the accessibility that, you know, it, you know, originally started out as a nice secretary's car is the way they talked about it back in the sixties. And I think that Camaro's kind of lost sight of that. And I think Mustang, you know, with having the better visibility, the bigger windows, the better comfort, more interior space, a slightly bigger back seat, you know, those types of things. I think, you know, if you so if you go and sit in a Mustang, then you go sit in a Camaro, you're gonna feel like you're sitting in a cave in the Camaro compared to the Mustang. And, you know, for the average tire kicker that's going around shopping cars and has no biases, if you put them in both of those cars and tell them which one you want to drive every day, Mustang's gonna win every time just because you can see out of it. Um, it's not a tall thing to, or a tall ask. It's just, it's just the way it is, you know? And so I think that's what they screwed up with the Camaro. The fifth gen also didn't have great visibility, uh, but I think the fifth gen um, sold a lot on hype. I, it was hype and market conditions because, you know, the, this, the fifth gen sold, you know, they came out whenever the Mustang had already been out for a couple of years, everyone had already had their fill of Mustangs for a few years. The Camaro was the new hot thing. The Challenger wasn't on the scene yet. The Charger was just a four-door, and that was it, you know. So I think that Camaro came in. It was still the retro styling people love from the Mustang, but it was a little bit different, had a little more power, had, you know, the more advanced suspension. So it was kind of really a nice upgrade for a lot of those people that bought the S197 Mustangs in their first couple of years. And then, you know, that wore off. And, you know, I mean, people love that fifth gen, and I love the fifth gen as well, but then it was just like, okay, well, the next thing, you know, what are we going to have? And then Mustang came out with the brand new S550s that were very impressive. And Camaro came out with a six gen Mustang, which was, or six gen Camaro, which was very impressive from a dynamic standpoint, but that wasn't enough anymore. And it just being different than the, than the Mustang wasn't enough anymore. And then you had Challenger come onto the scene, 
you know, and then Challenger got better and better with every year, and they were so good about upgrading it and doing new special editions and stuff, which Camaro wasn't doing. And I think that's how Camaro just kind of fell to the back of the pack. You know, it was a lack of uh, changes and just a lack of friendliness for the average commuter. Um, because, you know, there's only so many enthusiasts out there that appreciate an independent rear suspension that's more advanced and only a certain amount of people that, you know, don't care and are willing to live with the crappy visibility before you run out of buyers. And you got to market to the masses. And Mustang markets to the masses really well. Challenger markets to the masses even better these days, which is why Challenger outsold Mustang here, I think, in the past few months. Mustang's also stale, but so is the Challenger. So, I mean, it's just, you know... I think Dodge has just mastered the marketing, which is what you got to do. And I mean, their marketing is, I mean, look at how many, I've seen more Challenger commercials in the past week than I've probably seen in my entire lifetime on the Camaro, you know? So it's also just that thing of like, there's just a large amount of people that probably have no clue Camaros even exist anymore. Um, but they see a Challenger every time they go to the theaters and watch the Fast and Furious movie, you know? So there's there's a lot of that I think that plays into it as well, but I think it's a very complex problem. Those are just a few of the you know components, but um, but a great question. Question. So thanks for asking, Sam. I see we got um, a couple other super chats here. I don't want to miss them. So uh, two chances. I just want a crazy Matt car ownership story. Well, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of them you probably could just see from the videos. You know, the mini leaving me stranded. I just you can watch that video. That's I think called like bad day in the mini or something like that that i posted of me standing on the side of the road with a smoking mini um and uh, that was hilarious then also i don't remember if i highlighted in that video but i literally broke down like a hundred feet away from a strip club too in a not great part of <laughs> of town so it was it was uh, a very interesting place to be stranded as well so <laughs> um yeah but there's you know that and um yeah i don't know i guess Aside from that, I don't really have too many crazy car ownership stories. I could probably get into like my first speeding ticket. I've done that, I think, in a couple of these live streams in the past, but I can do that as a little dedicated video someday, things like that. Again, it's just a matter of, you know, trying to blend those in with all the other videos I'm always so busy posting. But I'm sure a lot of you would probably appreciate, you know, the variety of having something that's not just a weekly update and a car review. So I'll try and work some more of that kind of stuff in whenever I can. Um, Luco, thank you so much for a super chat as well. He says, I had a Civic SI 2015 and a 2016 Jetta GLI. I love them, but I got tired of low profile tires. I now have an 06 Camry and an 18 RAV4. Boring, but I love them. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I think a lot of that is, you know, people's tastes just change over time, you know, whether it's just people getting older, people having different needs, or kind of just growing out of it. I mean, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasts that just kind of get over it after a while. And they're like, yeah, that was fun in my teens or in my 20s, but I'm over it. I don't need to go autocross anymore. Or I don't need to, you know, go racing around on Friday nights or whatever the case is. And, you know, I mean, everyone's different. Um, you know, some people, it's a lifelong thing as well. And, uh, you know, some people stick with, you know, certain types of cars their entire life. Other people evolve like you have into, you know, wanting something a little bit more comfortable and stuff. So, um, there's, uh, you know, there's no shame in any of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, but I mean, both those cars are great. And I mean, also another thing you always have to keep in mind too, is, you know, a lot of people, you know, can just change the tire setup and be a lot happier as well. So like if you were tired of getting flat tires or just rough rides, you can always downsize wheels and go up to thicker tires. It'll hurt your handling a little bit, but you know, like, I mean, like Jason Fenske from engineering explained, you know, he went down in size on his uh, Tesla, um, but it made the ride so much better. It made it so he could actually handle potholes without having it turn into a, you know, roadside event. And, um, you know, and it's, you know, you still have pretty good handling. So that's always an option too. If anyone's, you know, getting tired of, you know, having a rough ride, just put some nice old meaty sidewalls on your car and, uh, you know, you're set. So that's one thing I love about the bullet. The bullet has really thick sidewalls for being 19 inch wheels. And so it means you get a good ride and also kind of a little bit of a retro look, which I love. Um, so J Nomad or J N A G I M E. I don't know how to say that, but thank you so much for the super sticker and for being a number one fan. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, thanks for saying hello. And if you have any questions, I'll definitely try and keep an eye out for them as well. But thank you so much 
for the super sticker. And uh, Little Rocks RS says, um, if you ever want to go back to reviewing older modified cars, Matt, my RS will always be ready. I'll make the trip again, just like in the old uh, white ST. So yeah, he had the uh, Focus ST that I reviewed uh, a few years back. Thanks again for letting me review that, man. And uh, I appreciate the offer on the RS. That's another car that's probably worth revisiting here in a few years. Um, cause you know, it's been a while since I think I had the press car back in 2017. That was a lot of fun, but I know you've done some stuff to yours too. So it'd be cool to try a, a modified one out as well. So, um, I've, so yeah, I did a GT 500 this past week and I'm going to do a little more traveling this year to review some more stuff, but I'm after the gas prices though, that I paid this week, I'm actually, I'm probably gonna try and limit how much traveling I do this year and also limit how much people travel to me. Cause I just would feel bad. Someone spending a fortune on gas to come up and meet me somewhere. Cause like, just to like go film this GT 500, which I filmed in Hershey PA, which is like three and a half hours from Pittsburgh here. And, um, just for gas to go out there and back, I probably spent like a hundred bucks, maybe $110 on gas for 450 miles. And then the tolls on the turnpike here in Pennsylvania, it's like 20 bucks each way. So I basically spent almost $150 in my own money to go review this car. And then I'm hoping on the ad revenue to kind of pay me back for that. I mean, it's obviously a business write off and stuff, but you know, it's, it's not cheap to be going on these road trips these days. So I'm probably going to try and limit it a little bit here. And I'd feel bad having you spend a hundred bucks in gas just to come up and, uh, you know, hang out as well. So maybe once gas prices chill out, you know, we can do some more road trips like that, but I'm going to try and do some stuff. that's a little bit closer to home. I'm going to be reviewing hopefully here in the next week or so. Um, an NB and yeah, an NB Miata, the last year, like a 2001 Miata that's local here that was offered to me. So that is going to be another privately owned car I'll be reviewing, but that's like 40 minutes away from me. So it's a, a lot more manageable and uh, not a big gas hit with that one. But, um, but yeah, so other questions here. Um, we have uh, someone at uh, SLMD Sedan says, been here since Super X fan. Thanks for being a fan for so long. I appreciate all of you who have uh, stuck with me here all these years. It really means a lot, and I really appreciate it. Um, Leo says, would you rent the GT500H? I just talked about in the weekly update uh, on Friday. It's uh, Hertz is doing a 900 horsepower version of the GT500. You can rent for 400 bucks a day. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if to me, I wouldn't bother paying four hundred dollars to do that because I've driven GT five hundreds for free, and you know, I if I were to rent something, I would probably want to rent something I haven't driven before or something that I, you know, would love to spend more time with. The GT five hundreds are fun; I would be happy to spend more time in one, but I wouldn't pay four hundred bucks a day to do it um, personally. So yeah, I wouldn't do it, but uh, I don't blame anyone who wants to go for it. I'm sure it'll be fun. Just be very careful because nine hundred horsepower is a lot to handle. Even a stock GT500, um, you know, can be quite a handful as well. Um, and uh, Jay Imagine says, uh, Matt, get yourself a Fiat 500, 45 MPG. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's uh, a lot of stuff that I, it's almost, I mean, obviously gas isn't quite that expensive, but it almost is like worth considering like a fun, like super cheap, a uh, little like, uh, you know, fuel efficient vehicle just for doing road trips and things like that. in. but I love the bullet too much. I'd rather just pay the super high gas prices and have the fun on the bullet if I'm going to do a long trip. Um, and uh, Tu Chang, thank you so much for another super chat. He says, last one, Elon might block me when he buys YouTube, but the Model S is looking old. <laughs> well, oh man, I hope Elon doesn't buy YouTube because, ugh. Uh, I don't want to get into that too much because I'm sure there's uh, people on both sides of that opinion as well. And I try and stay very neutral when it comes to all this stuff. Um, <laughs> that's a funny comment. I appreciate that. And, uh, but yeah, Model S is looking old, but um, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think they just kind of don't care. I think they, you know, sell pretty well. I think also Elon might be kind of moving away from caring about Tesla a little bit. I mean, he's been selling a lot of shares of Tesla recently, probably to fund, you know, to the Twitter buy and everything else. But I mean, if he's selling a, you know, billions of dollars worth of shares, I mean, then he's going to have less of a influence in the company in some ways. And I feel like that's also just indicative of his maybe less, you know, interest. I mean, he's already said now that like Tesla superchargers will eventually start having a uh, less, uh, or superchargers are going to have the normal CCS connectors at some point. He didn't say exactly when, but he's going to start doing that. So that means that anyone will be able to start using Tesla superchargers pretty soon. Um, and that's also the case, I think, in Europe. I think he said he's opening up superchargers 
to um, basically anyone here, I think this year in Europe, I might be later here for the States, but so, I mean, he's essentially giving up Tesla's biggest advantage, in my opinion, is the supercharger network and how good it is. He's basically throwing that out the window because, I mean, part of it is I'd like to think he actually is passionate about trying to, you know, uh, improve the world with electric vehicles and stuff. And so, you know, it might be that he just cares so much about that goal that he doesn't care about tanking his own company. Um, and it's also a company he's continuing to own less and less of. So maybe there's some of that. But I also think, you know, he made his mark. The Model S made its mark. It did its thing. You know, he has it out there. It's been paid off from an engineering standpoint, you know, so it's just like, well, this is just a cash cow now. It's like an old Toyota 4Runner. It's like, well, they're ancient, but people still keep buying them. So let's just keep them around and see how long we can keep this going for before people finally, you know, uh, throw in the towel and demand something better. But it, until people demand something better, it'll keep on surviving. I think it's going to be the same thing with the Model S. It'll be the next 4Runner that sticks around way longer than it should, but it's because people buy them. And so you can't really blame the company for keeping them around. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think Tesla's also just, they don't have, for some reason, they haven't been able to scale up as far as development goes with their cars. They're still acting like they're this tiny little startup that can't get cars out. You know, the Cybertruck's been delayed a million times. Who knows when that thing will ever arrive. You know, they're talking about a small affordable car for other parts of the world. They're talking about, you know, the Tesla Roadster that was promised years ago that, you know, who knows when that'll come. So, yeah, you know, I think it's, it just, if, if they're going with this super slow rate and they continue on with this kind of pace, I mean, we're looking at another 10 years before you ever see a new Model S, but, uh, you know, we'll have to see, but, um, anyway, thank you for all the super chats too, Chang. I really appreciate it. And, um, feel free to also make any other comments here. I'll try and, uh, you know, pick them out here whenever I am scrolling through. But first I want to say a huge thanks to uh, Dom for being a member for three months. One of the first people to join uh, the memberships here and the Matt Moran motoring club. So thank you, Dom, for being a member. And his question here is, uh, what do you think about driving a modded RX-8? Um, I think that'd be sweet. I've, you know, they always sound super cool, the modified ones. Um, you know, I drove a stock one a few years back, as you probably know, and uh, that was uh, a lot of fun. You know, it's it was kind of the BRZ before the BRZ in some ways, and uh, it was just a really cool car. You know, no torque whatsoever. It's even worse than the, than the first gen BRZ in that regard. But uh, they're sweet. I'd love to try out a modified one just to, you know, see what it's like. I'm, I have a natural curiosity with most, most, most cars. I would be happy to drive just about anything just to be like, huh, so that's what that's like. And then, you know, move on from there. But modded RX-8 would be another fun one just to try out. That's why I love my job is just getting able to, you know, test out different things and just uh, satisfy my own curiosities in a way as well. Uh, Luco, thank you for another super chat. He says, my 06 Camry has an 18 gallon tank and I get 31 MPG. Pretty solid for an 06. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's, I'm kind of wondering if a lot of the older stuff that is fuel efficient is going to start getting more popular and also if SUVs are going to get less popular, like how we saw in 08, you know, whenever gas was four bucks a gallon last time, um, you know, everyone was dumping their excursions and their massive tanks for Priuses back then. And this time around, it's going to be everyone dumping their massive tanks for electric vehicles, probably, or at least hybrids. But, um, but yeah, I'll be curious to see if we have another, you know, thing of people going back to stuff, even if it's super old, just to get that good fuel economy again and giving up their huge gas hogs. We'll see. Um, Dom, thank you also for the super sticker. I appreciate the mustache there. Uh, my one good friend has been trying to get me to grow a mustache for years. I have refused and I will continue to refuse the mustache because I, uh, I don't think I could pull it off. Um, but thank you for the super sticker. Um, Sam says for someone who's interested in purchasing a new Mustang, what's the best value trim amongst the various offerings for the money? Um, yeah, it comes down to personal preference, but I'd probably suggest going for, uh, you know, the GT, if you can, I think that there's still really good value there for a base GT. If you know, you're okay, not having all the performance goodies and stuff. I think it's still a lot of fun for the money and the V8 Mustangs also get pretty good fuel economy. Still, I mean, that's one thing in the bullet out on this road trip. I mean, yeah, I spent a ton of money on gas, but it could have been a lot worse because I was still getting like 28 MPG in my V8 powered manual six speed Mustang. Uh, on the highway, it's really, you know, those motors are very fuel efficient for what they are. And so, I mean, a lot of these are, you know, other cars that I review, that are turbo four cylinders can't even hit 28 MPG. So uh, I think the, you know, V8 Mustangs are definitely one of the fun ones. But EcoBoosts are also really great value for money too, if you're okay with, you know, the four cylinder and, 
and the sound of them and stuff. I think EcoBoost are also a fantastic value for sure. Um, and uh, Jay Imagine here says they almost uh, bought a 21 Mustang Mach 1, but it's 65. That's a no go. That's too much for a Mustang. Yeah, I agree. 65 grand, you're better off getting a GT350 or something like that if you're going to go for something like that. Um, Owen, oh, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, uh, Matt, thank you for doing these YouTube live streams. I've recently been looking into motorcycles due to current gas prices for fun. That's also another very good idea. Um, do you still have any interest in getting into riding? I definitely don't. Uh, motorcycles are one thing that I've never really been super drawn to. I'd, I wouldn't mind trying out dirt bikes, uh, off road if I, you know, had some time someday and, you know, had the spare cash to play around with something like that. Um, but on the road with how distracted every driver is out there these days, I just, I'd be way too paranoid to drive a motorcycle. If I'm going to have some, you know, person texting while driving and ram into me, I at least want to have metal and airbags around me if someone's going to ram into me. Um, so that's, uh, that's my hold up with motorcycles. It's just, I'm too much of a worry work to enjoy them. But for those who, you know, can handle the risk of them, I mean, yeah, obviously gas prices are no concern for motorcycle riders for the most part, because they get such good fuel economy. And from what I've heard, the adrenaline rush is unmatched. It's like people, most people that are adrenaline junkies, you know, it's like they have their fun in their fast cars. And then the next step is to go up and get a motorcycle because the adrenaline rush is way more, just way more exciting. And I'm probably missing out for sure by not, you know, going into motorcycles, but yeah, just not, not, uh, fitting with my risk profile, unfortunately. So I don't think I'll ever be covering motorcycles here on the channel. Um, Dave, the car guy says, do you fear with high fuel prices and costs of living if people will move to electric cars or stick with petrol? Um, I think it depends on how long the fuel prices last for. I think the thing with, you know, people running to EVs is, you know, I think that only really works for the more affluent people that, you know, maybe might be annoyed about paying gas prices, but it's not actually crunching them that much from a financial standpoint that they are okay to, you know, maybe like, you know what, this is a good time. Instead of wasting my money on gas, I'm going to go get an electric car. But I think for people that are a little more financially strapped, I think that, you know, the high fuel prices and the cost of living being high means those people will most likely end up at least just going for a hybrid. And I think this is what Toyota is really banking on. You know, they're really, you know, pushing their hybrids, you know, hard. And, um, and I think a lot of other companies are too, like Honda's just recently announced that, you know, they want their stuff to be hybridized extensively here for the next generation. Um, and you're going to see that start off here with the civic hybrid that's coming here. Um, they already announced, um, there's just going to be more and more of that. And so I think that's going to be the, you know, the, the immediate short-term fix for a lot of people, especially for people that live in more urban places where they're doing the stop and go driving, where the hybrid really comes in to, you know, help you out a lot. I think for those people, you know, it's going to make a lot more sense. You know, anyone right now with gas prices, the way they are, if you're going into a Toyota dealership and you're, you're going to buy a RAV4, you got to be crazy to not spend the extra thousand dollars for a hybrid RAV4 over a regular one, because, you're going to make that money back, you know, very quickly, you know, as long as you drive a decent amount, um, going for the hybrid. So I think, you know, I think that's why Toyota is really ramping up the hybrids. Honda is too. And so I think that's what you'll see, you know, just like again, in 08, everyone went and bought Priuses. I think yeah, you'll see that kind of thing as well. Um, is I think people are going to go for that. Obviously there are some people that are excited about the electric stuff and the hype of that, but they're just still so expensive for a lot of people. It's just, you know, it's, one thing that people are just not going to be willing to, you know, make that big of a leap, I think, uh, right now. Uh, Dom, thank you so much for another super sticker. I really appreciate uh, the thumbs up there and, uh, again, for joining and for all your support. And I see you have a question here. I didn't want to miss that. He says, my RX-8 is sweet. I'll show you what's been done to it. I think it's uh, what, or I think it's what's missing. Great handling Japanese, great uh, rear wheel drive cars. No turbo, just straight improv on what's already there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it sounds pretty sweet. You have to send me what you've done to it. Uh, but yeah, I think they sound really cool. And um, yeah, I actually, I was really excited about the RX-8 back in Tokyo Drift when that came out. I was, you know, like 16 when uh, the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift came out. And uh, Neela's RX-8 was always kind of really cool to me. Uh, she had that one and it sounded really good. At least the dubbed in uh, audio from that you know, car in the movie sounded really cool. Uh, so yeah, I'll be curious to check out your RX-8. I hope, hopefully you're getting decent fuel economy in that thing though, because those RX-8s, man, they drank fuel from what I remember. So hopefully you're not getting killed on gas prices. Um, 
but uh, yeah, thanks for, for all the support. I really appreciate it. I see uh, so, someone asked uh, if it's uh, Tim Brown says, is today a bourbon day? Um, today is not a bourbon day uh, right now. I'm just having my uh, bubbly here. But uh, yeah, I still have the bourbon every once in a while. It's been a while since I've done it in a weekly update because there hasn't been too many bad news stories recently that I've had to break out the bourbon for. Uh, but I definitely plan to break it out here if there's any other crazy stuff uh, to, to talk about. But um, yeah, it'll be... It's always, always good to have. I need to stock up on some more bourbon, though, because I've kind of exhausted my supply a little bit. All I have left is a bunch of scotch for the most part. So I need to go back and get some more bourbon and replenish. Um, all right. So other questions here is, uh, I say, someone, Jay, Jay Imagine is saying, I heard Toyota is making a Sequoia hybrid. Um well, it's, I think, you know, it's like that V6 from the Tundra, which has like a mild hybrid thing in it. Um, I believe that's, you know, what they're talking about. I don't know about a full-blown hybrid Sequoia. I'm sure that will probably come eventually, uh, but I don't think that's currently uh, at least been announced during the plans as far as I know. Um, uh, Copper says, what's your current uh, favorite minivan? Um, and I think... So, I mean, okay, obviously what's best will depend on, you know, what the person needs. But if you're asking about my personal favorite minivan, I would probably, you know, I don't know. I, I can, I can safely say this, the Sienna is probably last on my list because it's so underpowered and that four cylinder is so buzzy because it has to work so hard to get that thing moving. Um, but, uh, so I would, Honestly, so in the Odyssey is like a torque steer monster the way that thing, like at least in the wintertime, that thing just loves to roast the tires, um, which is fun, but for a family car, just eh. And the infotainment isn't great in the Odyssey either. So honestly, I think my current favorite minivan is probably the Pacifica. Um, especially, I think the Pacifica, uh, the plug-in hybrid version is actually pretty cool. It's, it's still the only plug-in hybrid, amazingly, in a minivan. Uh, you would think all the others would have caught up in the past five years here, but they haven't. Um, but Pacifica, I think, is just it has the best infotainment system. Um, you know, I th actually think it's the nicest looking one of the bunch as well. I think this, the close second will be the uh, the Kia. Why am I blanking on the name? I reviewed it. I don't just, uh, I reviewed it last year. I just do not remember the name of the Kia minivan, but that is also, um, I, I'd say it's probably a tie between those two. I think the materials are nicer in the Pacifica, especially if you go for the high end ones. Um, but, uh, the Kia, you know, also looks really cool. The Carnival, that's what it is. Um, but you know, the Kia Carnival is, uh, kind of, you know, like a Range Rover look to it and, uh, has still the great infotainment system that, uh, Kia has as well. Um, but and Dom says fuel economy for the RX8 is the same as his V8 V8 truck at best. Who, yeah, you're a brave soul to be driving that thing these days, man. But more power to you. That's awesome that you're driving around an RX8 at these gas prices. And uh, yeah, maybe have some scotch, some scotch to ease the pain of filling up the RX8. Um, but uh, thanks for for joining, Dom. I appreciate it. Isaac, thank you also for being a member and for joining here. He says GTI or Civic Si. Um. So, you know, personally, I haven't driven the new GTI, so I can't say as far as new GTI versus new Civic Si, but what I can say is I really love the new Civic Si, and, you know, the German electronics and Volkswagens and the infotainment system in the GTI mean that, and also the fact that it is more expensive than the Civic Si. So if it were my money, I would go for a Civic Si, even without having driven the GTI, just for what I know about them. And what they are, I would probably go Civic Si. The GTI obviously is going to probably be a little bit more exciting from a driving standpoint, probably is a little bit better sorted. But the Civic Si has one of the best shifters in a modern vehicle right now. Um, it just feels great. I think the power is really fun. I love that it's you know more powerful than I was expecting it to feel. It's definitely an underrated motor. It's making way more power than they're claiming. And um, I just really love the ergonomics of the Civic, the visibility and just the steering the shifter, the, the pedal placement, the throttle response, just Honda nails all the little things perfectly, at least in my mind that like I get in the Civic SI and I'm like, ah, I'm at home. Like, I feel like I'm in my own car when I'm in a Civic SI or any of the new Civics. They're just so good. And, um, so yeah, I think, uh, Civic SI would be the way that I would go. Um, especially considering, you know, yes, the GTI is going to be faster, 
but it's also you know a good bit more expensive and obviously you get more features and stuff that you can't get in the civic si but um you know i would probably go civic and just because of how well i like the civic si even if you want a more luxurious interior that at that point i would consider the integra as a competitor because you can get a, a 37 grand gti or you can get a 37 grand uh integra that's also a hatch that yes has less power but in my mind for a daily driver it's still enough power in the si and most likely the integra is the same case since it's not that much heavier um you know and then you know i i just think i'd probably be happy with that but again i'd have to drive the integra to you know make sure they didn't screw anything else up um with the transition from the si to that but um you know i think that's i'd probably stick with the hondas personally um dom says it's not his main vehicle for the arc state so that's good at least you don't have uh you know probably not burning through gas too fast in that um isaac also says yeah that is what i'm leaning to civic si even though the heated seats are gone yeah it's a bummer i'm not sure you know where you live as far as how handy that comes in for you but you know with cloth seats heated isn't i mean it's certainly nice to have don't get me wrong and sure i wish they didn't get rid of it but you know, in my experience with cloth seats in the past, you know, they warm up quicker in the winter. You don't feel quite as freezing cold as you do when you're sitting down on, you know, ice cold leather uh, that needs to be heated, you know, a lot faster. So, um, you know, I mean, again, yeah, it's unfortunate, but to me, not having heated seats wouldn't be a deal breaker in the SI, but you know, again, everyone's different. So um, don't blame me for that. And like Copper is saying, uh, you know, a launcher N is another possibility. If you like the Civic SI formula, and you're willing to spend a few grand more, you know, I would say a launcher and definitely I would pick over a GTI. Again, I've not driven the GTI, but I would even pick in a launcher and over a Golf R. So unless the Golf R is worse than the GTI, I would probably say that, yes, I would take in a launcher and over a GTI. Um, a launcher and is just so much fun. They just did the drama right. I don't care that it's slower or I don't care that, you know, this thing or that thing might not be as good or this number might not be as good as that number. But the launcher and just crackles and pops like crazy. There's a ton of adjustability to it. There's a ton of toys. It has, you know, big shiny rev button for rev matching. Or if you have the DCT launcher N for the no grin shift thing or the overboost function, just fun little toys like that, that, you know, just, it just, it's, it's fun. And these days, you know, again, if you want to have the fastest thing at a stoplight, go buy a Tesla and be done with it, you know? So, I mean, if you're, I think the whole, like, you know, <clears throat> bragging rights thing is kind of stupid these days. So, you know, I, I don't even care which one's faster. It's just the launcher hands more fun. And that's all that it takes for me to, you know, recommend one over another. Um, even if objectively there might be one thing or another that's, you know, better spec wise with another car. I just, I think they nailed the Elantra in, um, in every way, and including the pricing, which these days, like I was mentioning at the beginning of this live stream, is hard to do. A lot of car companies don't care about pricing being competitive anymore because there's not enough supply and they're just trying to maximize profits. But, Hyundai didn't do that. Even though they have a certain limited supply of chips, they're still like, yep, we're going to charge a reasonable amount of money for this thing. We're going to sell as many of them as we can and not artificially limit supply. And I respect the heck out of them for doing that because that's something that's getting more and more rare these days. And another reason why I think Hyundai is awesome right now. So um, yeah, a little side rant there. Um, uh, slow or SLMD sedan says thoughts on the Escalade V. I talked about it in the weekly update here on Friday, so you can watch that for my coverage on that. But um, I will be actually reviewing the Escalade V. I'm going to be reviewing that here on uh, the middle of next month, and I'll have all my thoughts on what it's like to launch a uh, 682 horsepower, I think it is, massive full size SUV. It's going to be hilarious and outrageous and excessive in every way, but it should be an absolute blast and another one of those fun cars to look back on in 20 or 25 years and be like, man, remember when Cadillac put a crazy supercharged V8 in an Escalade? Wild times. We're living in those wild times, and it's something you just got to soak in and just enjoy. Okay, other questions here? Sam says, will there be a, an acceleration reaction video compilation? Um, I'm guessing you mean like a, a new one soon because there's obviously already been, I think, you know, four of them. Yeah. Um, so I always do those every time I had 100,000 subscribers, which uh, used to be pretty frequent that I was growing a lot faster back in the day. So I had a new one of those, you know, once every year or two. It's obviously since then slowed down a lot and it'll probably be, I'll probably be 50 before I ever hit 500,000 subscribers. But, uh, you know, 
I don't know. I, maybe I'll do one sooner since it sounds like 500,000 subscribers is going to be a long time from now. Uh, so maybe I'll do one at 450 or something instead. Um, you know, which even that alone will probably take me another year or two to do. But um, yeah, I'm hoping to you know do one eventually because I'm sure people enjoy those. And it's been a long time, so I'll have a lot to compile for the next one for sure. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll probably try and do one of those here sometime. Maybe if maybe this year, maybe I'll do one towards the end of the year as a year end wrap up or something like that. We'll have to see. Um, and uh, Dom is saying, I feel like you have a great driver POV. I've given a, I've driven a good amount of, of cars that you have driven non exotic, and your opinion is spot on. Your opinion is amazing, accurate. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you agree. Um, I don't get, always get everything right, you know. Obviously, I, um, you know, I mean, there's just some times where I. I have a different experience than someone else that's reviewing a car. Like for example, the Hyundai and the Kia uh, highway drive assist system all is almost always terrible in my experience. But then like a lot of other reviewers, they swear it's the best highway drive assist thing out there. It's the best adaptive cruise system they've ever seen. And I guess they just have a better car or it's calibrated differently, or my roads are more challenging than theirs or something. I don't know what the deal is, but you know, with my reviews, as you know, I'm always honest. I just tell it like it is. You know, sometimes that, uh, you know, means that I agree with all the other journalists. Other times I don't agree with them. And, you know, that's okay. That's the, the beauty of having different viewpoints and perspectives. But I've, you know, I've been hearing a lot, you know, that people have been kind of saying that, like, I just did the Elantra N uh, week with video. And I was, you know, talking about some of the weird quirks of that car because it has these strange things that it does. Um, and, a lot of people that own those are like, yeah, like absolutely. Like why does the heat blast on the highway when I have no air conditioning on? Like, and you know, random little things. So I'm glad that I'm hopefully, you know, nailing it in a lot of these videos and I'm really, you know, mentioning things that are valuable and important and accurate for a lot of you guys. And hopefully, you know, these videos are continuing to be really helpful um, for all of you. And so, uh, but thank you for, for the kind words. I really appreciate it, Tom. And thank you for another super sticker. I really appreciate all the support for sure. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we also have Luke here has another super chat. Thank you so much. He says back in middle school, I wanted a cobalt SS. That's another car that will probably be one of those future collectibles. Like we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, that's another one that it's, uh, hard to find one that has not been, uh, heavily modified. So if you can find a stock one, you know, and it's reasonably low miles, it's going to be probably another big, big money car down the road. And, uh, yeah, those were really cool in high school. I remember <clears throat> back in the day, this is like, I don't know when, when those came out, I think it was what, like 2005 or 2006. That was back when I was still using <clears throat> LimeWire. For those of you who are around the same age as me, I was using LimeWire to download street racing videos before YouTube was a thing. And like, that's how people shared videos. And so it'd be like Cobalt SS first WRX. And I'd be like, oh, cool. And I download it. And then, you know, with dial up internet, I like click download and then I like wait 20 minutes. And then I'm like, oh, sweet, it's done. And then I watch like this tiny video taken on a potato of, you know, a Cobalt SS racing a uh, WRX in the middle of the night or something like that. And, um, and so, yeah, I always thought they were really cool. They were just, they sounded so good. And the supercharger wine, I love the one that I reviewed a few years ago too. Those were, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I'm curious to try the turbo one because I've only done the supercharged one. Uh, but the turbo one, um, it's probably really cool too. Um, and Dom says, your opinion will always be different. Um, your opinion is always down to earth though. I don't always agree. It's just honest. You show enough for us to make our own decisions. And that's always my goal. Cause you know, again, I don't, I don't need to like, you know, compare myself to other car reviewers, but you know, I, a lot of people in the past have uh, wanted me to do like a score or some type of rating system or something. And I don't think that's helpful for you guys because you know, what Doug thinks about, you know, this car, as far as looks goes like that doesn't, that shouldn't in, you know be involved in a scoring. I just, to me, that kind of stuff seems a little bit unhelpful, um, you know, cause you might not feel the same way I do. So that's why I say, Hey, the throttle response is super sharp. Some people might hate that. Some people might love that. It is what it is. It's super quick. Make of it as you wish. Instead of me being like, this is the best throttle response. I try not to say that kind of stuff. I say it's this way or it's that way. You decide whether that's something that, you know, is going to be exciting for you. Um, and so there's a lot of things like that where I try and just put the info out there. Cause this, this channel again is about you guys, not about me. It's about helping you find a car you will love 
That's why I do this because I, I just truly think that if every one of us is driving a car that puts us in a slightly better mood every day, the world will be a slightly less miserable place. <laughs> and we'll all have a little bit of a smile on our face going to work in the morning because we're driving something that we love. And that's my own my own little way of trying to contribute to the happiness in the world just ever so slightly. Um, but uh, I see people are uh, talking about LimeWire here. That was, was good times. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be 32 here in a couple of months. So that's dating myself as far as how that was. That's the street racing videos I grew up on. Um, so, yeah, no one's heard of LimeWire in a decade. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, you're 32 as well, Dom. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll be 32 here in July. So uh, right around the same age. Um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, so Zachary says, hey, Matt, my mom jumped from a 2002 Pontiac Grand Prix SE to a 2015 Kia Sorento LX with 134,000 miles on it going strong, no issues. It still has the 10-year 100,000-mile warranty on it, which is good. Um, well, if it has the 100,000-mile warranty, I guess, yeah, if you cross over 100, then that's on, obviously not in effect anymore. But I'm glad it's going well for you and, and for her and it's a strong car. Those Pontiac Grand Prix are another one that might be a future collectible someday because, uh, you know, another like mundane car, but you know, that you get those with that supercharged, what is it, the 3400 V6 or something, I think that's the name of that motor. That thing had so much supercharger wine. I had a buddy in high school that had one of those, and uh, those things are actually pretty cool for their time. Um, SLMD yes, Sedan says, hey, Matt, do you remember this, the show MTV True Life Street Racing episode? I love that episode. I don't think I've ever seen that episode of it. I I think I might have watched a little bit of MTV True Life. Uh, I think most of the time back then on MTV, I was just watching Cribs and like Room Raiders and, and stuff like that. And then, t you know, TRL and, and all that, uh, the music videos and stuff, which, man, really throws it back. Um, but that's about it. I don't remember that street racing episode, though. It's interesting. Yeah, but apparently it's a must watch. So I'll have to so go back and see if I can find it on YouTube or something. Good time. Uh, all right. So uh, Brandon says, thoughts on the Acura TSX? Never driven a TSX, actually. So I have no information to provide for you, unfortunately. Um, they seem cool. You can get them with a manual. Um, I actually had a buddy a, a long time ago who had a TSX, I think. Um, they seem to like it. You know, it seems pretty, pretty reliable, pretty solid, you know. Uh, but I've never driven one, so I can't say that ge that generation or that era of uh, Acura TL though was sweet. I drove one of those, the Type S, very briefly when I worked at a car dealership once. Uh, but that was very fun for the little few minutes I had with that. But uh, never drove the TSX. Uh, Dom said he had a G6. He was jealous of the Grand Prix and the GTO. Yeah, G6. So the GTPs, those had a little bit more power in them, right? I don't even remember, but. Another car could be collectible. When's the last time you saw a Pontiac G6 on the road? I haven't seen one of those in years either. So, you know, another stuff. You never know. It could be collectible someday. Um, Orion says he hasn't watched MTV since they actually played music. Yeah, I know. It's uh, I miss the music videos and stuff they had on there. It was actually pretty cool because uh, you can kind of just leave it on in the background and like how I guess with you know playlists on YouTube you can do the same thing these days. But uh, it was just kind of fun having it like curated, you know. Um, Marco says, what's up? Love the channel. Thank you. I appreciate the support. Um, George Daniel says, favorite all-wheel drive sedan for under 25 grand. Hmm, I'm guessing you're talking used because if you're talking new, you're basically the early option is probably an Impreza. I'm trying to think of this other stuff that's all-wheel drive. Yeah, I don't think you can get a well, – maybe a, no, Legacy would be too expensive. Ultima all-wheel drive would be too expensive. Camry all-wheel drive would be too expensive. So you're talking used. Um, you know, I mean, WRXs are obviously fun. I, I still like the you know the previous generation were, were good cars. You can probably get one of those for under 25. Um, I think, you know, I'm trying to think of other things you could get. I mean, honestly, it's still probably the Deborah X or like a Legacy GT or something like that. Um, but those are those are really hard to find of the you know past generation Legacy GTs. So I'd probably just say Deborah X is still probably one of the best all drive sedans for under twenty five. Um, yeah, he said it used. Okay, yeah. So that's probably the only thing. Okay, so you're looking at the older German stuff, E forty six, three thirty XI. Um, yeah, I mean the E forty six is great. Even the E ninety, you know, generation BMWs are great. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with those. At least it's been a long time since I have. 
Um, so, you know, like, yeah, 335 could be a blast too with the all wheel drive, maybe one of those for under 25. The thing is though, I just, yeah, my rule of thumb is old German cars. Do not buy them unless you have a ton of money to spend on maintenance and stuff. Cause I mean, it's sometimes hit or miss. There's, I've had a couple of people that I've talked to that swear up and down, like they've had old BMWs that run forever and with just normal maintenance and they're totally fine. But I mean, there's just uh, so many that I've, from my experience of working at dealerships that sold that stuff where they just do not hold up and it's just a ton of money to keep them on the road. So I, I really don't even consider a lot of that old German stuff just because it's really a gamble. So I try and stick to, you know, Japanese or American stuff. If you're looking at all wheel drive, um, you know, stuff or anything for that matter, that's older than five years old. Um, you know, like a Lexus IS 350 all wheel drive, something like that. Um, you know, would be a solid choice, but you know, the old stuff, again, if you have a risk tolerance for it, I mean, don't let me stop you. I mean, you know, it, that's different for everybody. If you're someone who doesn't mind, you know, dealing with, you know, random check engine lights and little issues here and there, then, you know, it might be worth it for, you know, the, um, driving dynamics, which are, you know, excellent with E46s, for example, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and so there's a, there's a lot they have to offer. It's just, you know, you have to be prepared for all the downsides of them. And G35 um, is another one that, yeah, SLMD sedan mentioned. That's, you know, even like the G37X sedan um, that I just reviewed a few months back, you know, that was a 2012, I think. You can get one of those, a very nice one for well under 25 grand. Also super reliable. Everyone who comments on that video that owns one of those, by the way, is like, yeah, I have like a million miles on it and it's still running totally good. So like, Infinity G37 would probably be a top pick as well. Um, if you do want something a little more luxurious, it still handles great. I mean, it's a rear-wheel drive-based all-wheel drive system. Excellent dynamics. Sounds good. Reliable. You know, and yeah, I just I feel like that's probably one of the better ones out there, honestly. So uh, maybe that's another one to look into. Um, and Orion says, other than performance, are Mustangs considered reliable? Yeah, I think for the most part they are, especially the V8 ones. I mean, there's been lots of V8 Mustangs uh, that have gone a long time. I mean, there's even guys with S550s with well over 100,000 miles on them already that are going totally fine. That Coyote motor seems to do really well, uh, thankfully. So, yeah, I'd say that that's you know, a car you could definitely drive a long time. And, I mean, even with mine, I mean, I – I hope I put, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles on the bullet someday because that's what I want to do. I was uh, hoping to get at least 200,000 miles on that car. I think it will do it no problem. Um, Steven, thank you so much for another very generous super chat. He says, maybe not a listing of best and worst cars, but a listing of cars to consider if you're a collector or a person with a car hoarding problem. I do think versus uh, stock market, as you say, well-placed money could produce money. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I think it's really just the stuff that's, you know, you can, I guess it kind of comes down to, you know, putting yourself in other people's shoes and being like, okay, well, what is the stuff that people find really cool, you know, today and how will that stuff be collectible down the road? And then, you know, go back 10 years and then go back another 10 years and try and figure out, you know, and you kind of piece together just with, you know, the Integra and its explosion in value, um, you know, those, those types of vehicles, you know, what's going to be next and what's the stuff that you never see on the road anymore that will be a sight to see in, you know, five or 10 years. Um, you know, and there's also some of the stuff you could even go for, like some of the Japanese stuff. Like there's some, some of these companies that have these cars, they're waiting on the 25 year rule to bring them in like the R34 GTRs. I mean, you saw the frenzy probably when the R32s became legal at first, now, everyone wanted an R32 because it's like, whoa, we can finally get a Skyline here in the States. And everyone was rushing to get them. And I mean, I'm sure that those importers made a very pretty penny on all those, you know, R32s when they first you know, brought them over here. And, you know, R33s, I think, had a little less hype because people aren't quite as excited about those as they are with the R32s. Um, but I think the R34 is going to be the huge cash cow because everyone loves R34s. Um, they've aged well from a styling standpoint. You know, they're just they're I think that's gonna be another really big one that you know, if you can um secure an R34 ahead of time. I mean, I'm sure, especially after the R32, you know, rage that they'll I'm sure these importers and stuff already have them. I've seen warehouses of R34s just waiting to be unleashed on the US here once they finally can. So I'm sure a lot of that stuff's already spoken for, but if you can get your hands on an R34 and then wait to import it until you know they're legal over here and then sell it for you know a bunch of money. Something like that could, you know, be something good too, or any other, you know, JDM car that we can't get. Um, you know, like I guess what else is not in the 25 year rule yet that you might be able to do? Because Supras, you can already bring those over. 
Um, you know, and so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's got to be some other things I'm forgetting. But, you know, regardless, you know, something like that could also be something worth collecting. But, um, you know, it just I just try and find, you know, random stuff that you haven't seen in a long time. They'd be like, hey, maybe someone would appreciate that someday. Like, you know, like what about the hatchback Civic SIs with the goofy little shifter that came out of the out of the uh, dashboard there? I think that was the, what are those, the 0102s? Like, no one has any of those anymore. I don't know what happened to all those. They all evaporated. Like, you see all the other Civics from the 90s, and you see everything from the 2000s, but then there's this weird gap where you see none of those goofy little, you know, SI hatchbacks that were over here that were, is like a European vehicle. It didn't match any of the other Civics, you know, in the States here at that time. But another really cool little quirky thing that, you know, that would be a big hit probably at a car show, um, you know, especially in a few years, you know, find one of those that's in good shape and, you know, get it for a good price, and while wow, no one wants it, and then, you know, once it comes out of hiding, and it's like, oh, wow, that's super cool, you know, something like that could go for big money someday and bring a trailer, too, especially considering how the Integras are doing, so, you know, uh, there's a bunch of stuff like that. I'd have to really sit down and, again, kind of compile this, and maybe that'd be a good, fun video to do myself, is kind of compiling a list of what I think will be, you know, valuable in a few years, and, uh, you know, see what you guys think about that. Um, goth rocker. Thank you so much for a very generous super chat here as well. He says, Matt, you're right. My one friend, I told him not to buy a 2010 Audi A8, told him lots of issues. He busted me for buying a fancy Ford when I bought a 2017 Lincoln Continental with all wheel drive. Audi towed seven times already. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, you tried warning him. So, you know, you were a good friend. You did what you could do. And, uh, it is what it is. Yeah, those, and it's, you know, I felt for it as well. You know, with the mini, the mini is the same kind of thing where, you know, the mini, was a super nice car and you know it was a lot of money back whenever they first came out and i was able to get a used mini you know it was only a couple years old for you know very little money and it's like wow it's a great deal i'm getting like this you know bmw based car that's got a manual it's fun it's you know quick it's really enjoyable and i'm getting it for so cheap they depreciate so fast sweet and it's like everything that depreciates fast does it for a reason that mini was you know, the most unreliable car I've ever owned. Unfortunately, I know some people have good luck with them, so I don't want to speak in generalities, but you know, usually when things drop like a rock, there's a good reason why all the German vehicles depreciate like crazy. There's a good reason why even my wife's uh, 2019 Mercedes C 300, um, you know, we're, we were going to buy that car out one to buy us some more time for the replacement car that's coming, but also, um, you know, just because I thought we had some equity in it because we had 10,000 miles a year on the lease agreement, um, which means we should be at 30,000 miles now. We're at like not even 11,000 because, again, we hardly ever go anywhere. Um, and also, Beth quit working once COVID hit. So, um, you know, we have no miles on us. So I was like, oh, wow, we're going to have tons of equity in this C class you know, easy decision. I'm going to buy it out and, you know, we'll have a bunch of equity to roll into the next car. It'll be great. And then I looked at the lease agreement, you know, and especially with used car values being so high, I was like, yeah, there is no way that, you know, this is going to go badly. Like I'm definitely going to probably buy this out. And then I looked at it and a few months back, I had a couple grand in equity in the lease there based on the blue book values. But then used car prices have softened a little bit. And since they've softened up, um, it's now at the same price, even with the crazy economic situation of you know, everything going on here with supply stuff, <clears throat> that car still is insisting on depreciating so fast that I can't even buy out the lease without being, you know, without it being a bad financial decision. So <clears throat> that car is being turned in like any other lease throwaway with 30,000 miles, even though it's like super loaded up with options and only has 11,000 miles on it. And it's, it's in great shape. It has a ceramic coating. It's got tinting super cherry car whoever picks that thing up after we turn it in is going to get a really good deal hopefully I'm, I'm sure the dealer will probably mark it up to oblivion but someone's getting a good a good car and a good deal and it's not going to be us because unfortunately the the, the lease buyout's just not going to work out <clears throat> and it's just but you know especially here in pa you got to pay sales tax if you buy it out so even if you know the trade-in value was the same as the buyout then I got to pay 7% sales tax here on that amount that I'm buying out. And then I'm, you know, further, you know, upside down on it for that. So yeah, anyway, long tangent, but you know, even with the used car values being as high as they are, these German cars, this was a $56,000 C300 in 2019 is now worth like 34. So <laughs> with, with 11,000 miles on, it's just hilarious how bad they depreciate. So German cars are great lease cars, you know, lease them, 
you know, use them up and then dump them. Unfortunately, they're beautiful cars. They're wonderful to drive, but <clears throat> they just drop like rocks because they're, you know, they just do not hold up, unfortunately, anymore. Carl Wright, thank you so much for the very generous uh, super chat there. Um, I see you have their, your thing, but I see there are some questions of your first super chat. I must have, must have missed it. Sorry, let me see. Let me scroll up and look for it here. I definitely want to answer your question. Um, okay, I think I got it here. Matt, love your channel and all the content too, Beth. Please try Highway uh, for Kias. My Kia Sportage Lane Assist beeps regularly on familiar roads with lines of pavement color variations. <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, I've i tried, you know, and that's kind of what I was complaining about in most of my Hyundai and Kia reviews. The highway driver assist system isn't great. I mean, it, you know, it, yeah, you know, beeps, but it's not even just the beeps. Like, even the lane keeping assist that's supposed to be doing the automated steering for me doesn't hold it in his lane very well. And it's ping ponging back and forth. And some cases it was really bad where, like, if a cop was following me, they'd probably pull me over because they think I was drunk because it's just like, oh, I'm going here and here and here and then going over the line a little bit and over this line a little bit. And it's like, man, like, obviously you're supposed to have your hands on the wheel and really be doing it. But it's like, it's this confusing thing for consumers though, because it's like you tell people, like, oh, this helps you. So it's like, okay, so if it's helping me, that means I can let my guard down. But it's like, you really can't let your guard down. So if I'm still having to act like I'm driving this car myself, then what's the point of having the steering assist? Because I'm already doing the steering myself. So it's either give me the steering assist or don't give it to me, but don't double up on it. You know, like don't have it try and steer and me try and steer too, because then I'm just fighting the car, you know? So it's like, is this whole thing. <clears throat> I think, you know, one, until we get to everyone having the same tech that Cadillac does with Super Cruise and Ford does with Blue Cruise, until we get to that point, I think these, you know, hands-on systems, you know, some of the better ones can actually be helpful because you can rely on them a little bit, but others, you know, they're not reliable. And so, you know, depending on, like you said, the pavement color variations, road line variations, how well the road lines have been paved, you know, there's a bunch of variables there that you know, some of these systems are pretty dumb, honestly, still. And so, you know, they get fooled very easily and confused and you can't rely on them. So um, hopefully that answered your question there. Hopefully, you know, the Kia gets better for yours. Um, oh, so you're saying your highway has dark pavement lines. Please try a different road. Yeah, I, so there's been different times where I have tried lighter stuff. Um, I don't think I've tried straight concrete. I don't know if there is any roads like that around me. I think it's all asphalt for the most for, most part. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of where I could go to do a different type of a highway test in those. But I mean, I'd be curious to try a different type. But honestly, though, I had the same experience even in the Genesis G90 on a long road trip. That I took it from Pittsburgh to um, the east coast of Maryland. And that was like a four and a half hour drive. Maybe I mean, it was actually like a five hour drive. I was driving through Pennsylvania, through Maryland, um, on various highways, different types of surfaces. And that was the same thing where I, I kind of got so fed up with it that I finally was just like, you know what, I'm giving up because I tried it the whole way down for five hours. And it was, you know, I had to babysit it constantly and it just, it wasn't good. So I, I've tried it outside of my normal local roads too. I also tried it actually, I, I think I did try it on some lighter paved concrete because if you watch my original I think it's the 2020 Sonata. Whenever this new generation Sonata came out, I went on the press launch in Arizona. And that was actually the first time I had tried that highway drive assist. And that was the worst experience because I was like, oh, cool. Like it has the little steering wheel light on saying it's helping me. And I feel it, you know, turning the wheel. So I actually, there was no one around, but I was like, okay, let's see how it does around this corner. And I just kind of let go of the wheel a little bit and it went straight over the line. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, can't rely on that anymore. And, uh, you know, so, and that I believe, I mean, I have footage, I think of the roads I was on. I think there's a forward facing camera in that video. So you can see the kind of roads I was on there in Arizona, but that was the same kind of thing, same problem. So, um, I don't know, I, maybe it's just me. I don't, I've always, I've gone through the settings and stuff, um, and there have been a couple other people who have agreed with me on that system not being great. I know a lot of reviewers love that system, but I have gotten some comments of people being like, yes, like I'm not crazy. Like there are other people that did not that say that system does not work well for them. So I'm not sure what the variable is that I'm missing, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, 
it's still just not great. But thank you very much for the uh, super chat. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask them or follow up here, and I'll, you know, we can discuss it a little bit more. But I really appreciate the very generous super chat. That's very kind of you. And Dom says, that's a bad feeling being in front of a police car when your adaptive cruise control is not accurate. Yeah, I mean, it's not something you want to mess around with. And also just from a safety standpoint, especially with, you know, speeds going up and up on highways these days and stuff, you know, the stakes are a lot higher, you know, with these, a lot of these highways having 70 mile per hour speed limits and stuff. It's, it's uh, you know, you don't want to have something where it's getting close to the road lines. And so it's really important for these car companies to get this stuff right. Um, and so, yeah, Carl says he's, he'll chuck back on the 2019 Sonata review, but um, his, so I guess yours works pretty well. I'm glad. I mean, I, I hope it works well. I hope I'm the weird one and it, it, it's a really good system and a lot of people are happy with it. Um, you know, I, I don't know what, again, the deal is with, with mine. Um, but uh, other questions here. Uh, Orion says, any word on a new type R? Honda seems to be milking the wrapped car for like forever. Yeah, that's something uh, a lot of these uh, companies like to do. Um, I think Honda also, they're really perfecting that type R. There's a longer development time, you know, for a lot of these Japanese performance cars, especially. Um, and so I think they're just taking their time and not rushing it. Um, as far as, what I've heard, I think they said it's this summer. I'm not sure when, but I believe I remember hearing in a teaser or something that um, it is coming this summer. I don't have any info from Honda uh, on that regard. Uh, all I know is the press drives for the HRV are happening, I believe, here. Um, some, I think it's the middle of June or something. So that's the next Honda news thing you can expect is new HRV. Uh, but aside from that, no info on Type R currently, um, but it should be soon, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, so we have Zachary says, hey, Matt, just to show you how rare the 2017 and up Acura NSX is, I saw a red NSX back in the summer of 2018. I'm guessing that's the last time you saw one. Yeah, they are super rare. I'm telling you, whenever I had the uh, NSX in 2020, I believe it was, yeah, I had the yellow one. I mean, people were really excited when they saw that thing because it's, yeah, you really don't see them. Um, that's another car underappreciated obviously that one's a lot more expensive but nsx's are very underappreciated look at what happened with the older nsx's obviously those were kind of appreciated more than uh, the new ones are but i think the new one is ahead of its time i said that in my review you know you see now corvette's gonna have an all-wheel drive with an electric front axle here you know in a few months guess what nsx has been doing that for five years now nothing new there so you know i think the nsx is another car people look back on and be like wow that was actually way ahead of its time that's really cool you know, obviously that's a lot higher of a buy-in from a collectible standpoint, but uh, another one that I think, you know, could actually be uh, appreciating down the road. <clears throat> um, Stephen Raps is, amen on that. My wife um, insists on BMW and now has an X7, nice and all, but her 750 Li was a money burner. By the way, have you ever been to Munich? I'm going with brothers soon. We'll be doing a BMW tour. That's awesome. I have not been to Munich. I've flown through Munich. I believe it was Munich. Um, the one time I went to Europe, uh, or one of the times I went to Europe, but um, never actually been able to go through Germany. That's something I'd love to do someday. Um, I'd love to drive the Autobahn before they shut it down and slow it down with speed limits and stuff. Um, at least for the unrestricted parts, you know, I'd, be, I'd love to do that before that goes away, but, um, we'll see. Probably not going to be doing much international travel until the baby's a few years older, but, uh, <clears throat> maybe I'll be able to go with a press, uh, launch or something someday. We'll have to see. Um, and Jay Imagine here says the Z is taking forever. It is taking forever. Um, and I, now they're saying, I think summer, you know, is when it's going to be, coming out and also you know they're not making very many of them you know it's like everything else you know supply is going to be limited here for a while so um it's going to be very stressful for people who are trying to get disease here because they're going to be very tough to get but um yeah i cannot talk about pricing and until uh, the video goes live the review for the z will be going live at 12 or 1 a.m uh and like i mentioned earlier there will be lots to discuss in that video uh it's almost 38 minutes long i have a lot to say about that car and uh so yeah definitely definitely want to check that out and there will be timestamps for those who don't want to sit through all 38 minutes uh you can use the timestamps there to um hit the important parts and the controversial parts of that review and, and see what you think about it um fastline says you finally got your wife's new vehicle uh plan uh, ready for us 
Um, I'm so I didn't get the wife's new vehicle yet. So um, I mentioned a little bit earlier in the live stream here. I will be um, hopefully having a new car here for her by July. It's still kind of up in the air. There's still some variables that are, we're working out as far as which way we go. Um, we're pretty set on what we're going to do. I was like almost 100% set. And then we had some new variables here in the past couple of weeks. So we'll see. I will explain all once once we have finally um, you know, decided and actually got whatever we decided to get. But I don't want to announce it and then change plans and have to explain everything. So I'd rather just you know keep it vague uh, in the meantime. But we're coming up on two hours here. So maybe we'll do uh, one or two more comments here. I see we have two from the members. So I'll do those here and then I'll... Uh, sign off here for the day. Uh, Dom says, um, it's hit or miss, brother. Some Hyundais work well, some don't. I've driven Velosters, K5s, Ionic 5s. The Hyundai family is hit or miss with the adaptive cruise. I'm glad it's not just me. I'm glad other people have the same kind of hit or miss experience. So I pre appreciate the support, Dom. And thanks again for being a member and for joining us here. And Coke, please, thank you so much for being a member as well. He says, do you think the new Z will be able to compete with the Supra? Feels like the platform is way too old at this point. I will be discussing that a lot in the video tonight. Um, that is the thing. That's going to be the big, big news. There's going to be big news with the Z uh, in multiple ways here. Um, so you're going to want to, if you're a night owl, uh, stay up till midnight here on the East Coast. 12.01 a.m. Uh, is when the video will be going live Eastern time. So 9.01 there for you guys in uh, the West Coast. And um, yeah, that's when that video will be going live. Um, I will be very curious to see everyone's thoughts and everything with that video and that car i will be talking a lot about how it compares to the super in the video so i will be covering that a lot be sure to definitely stay tuned towards the end of that video where i'll really be going into a lot of the differences with the super but all through the video i will be comparing it to the supra the pros and the cons um and really really diving in into that comparison because i know that's the main car it's gonna be cross shop with the z i think and um i can't say anything more because i don't want to give any kind of driving impressions away um but you're definitely going to want to stay tuned for that video tonight uh, or tomorrow, whenever you can watch it. But yeah, so live at 12 o'clock Eastern time tonight. Yeah, 12.01 a.m. technically. They, for some reason, it's not midnight. It's 12.01. But uh, yeah, 12.01 a.m. tonight at midnight is when uh, you'll be able to watch that video. We go on live and um, be very curious for all of your thoughts after uh, you learn all the stuff about the Z here. But it'll, it'll be an interesting one. And um, yeah, so anyway, I wish I could say more, but I can't. So uh, anyway, we will cut off the, uh, the live stream there at that. But thank you all for joining. I had a blast here hanging out with you guys. Hope you enjoyed uh, asking your questions and hanging out and talking with us here. I'm going to try and get back to doing these once a month because I really enjoy doing this. And I know I've kind of dropped off there for a few months, kind of got busy in the way things worked out here. But uh, I'm hoping to do one again next month, um, probably towards the end of next month. So maybe count on late June for the next one and uh, but yeah in the meantime yeah stay tuned for the z video tonight as well as the gt500 review on the 2014 gt500 coming on wednesday and uh lots more exciting fun stuff i got a gr86 currently as my press car this week i'll be posting that soon and uh, lots of other fun stuff here to come as well so anyway thank you all very much for watching please have a good rest of your weekend here continue to stay safe and healthy as well i'll see you guys in the next one thanks for joining and take care